Welcome to the Friday Nightmares podcast. I am one half of your hosting team this evening, Heather Powell, coming to you today from Waterdown, Ontario, Canada. And with me, as always, is Mr. Smoke Show Crawford, coming to you from Swartz Creek, Michigan, chilling in my uh, living room on this beautiful Sunday evening. Um, I was like, yeah, like, uh, we did it. We did our homework and we made it through the second part of these remakes. <sighs> wow. That was a lot. I don't of know why we thought that was a good idea. <laughs> I remember when we started talking about this, we're like, oh yeah, we'll just do something nice and fluffy and easy. Boy, were no, we this wrong. Was, this was the opposite of fluffy and easy. This was challenging and exhausting. <laughs> well worth it with the movies, but good Lord, it was a lot of oh, them. Oh <laughs> man. So if you if you don't already know, our topic is famous horror remakes round two. Uh, we're looking at one offs in this episode. So last time we talked about franchises, some famous franchises, and we got some incredible feedback. Uh, I didn't get a chance to physically respond to him today, and I will later. But Phil, thank you so yes. much for your detailed feedback and reviewing each remake and your thoughts on it. And uh, I really respect the way you review movies and you never let me down. And points that you brought up, particularly for Nightmare on Elm Street, nothing but respect for your opinion. And I, I do think, appreciate that you liked me calling out the Robert England fanboys. Uh, and I also like that you brought some valid reasons as to why you didn't enjoy that re- that movie or the or the Rob Zombie one, and yeah. I think that's you know important when you're doing a critique of film. Uh, not that Scott and I are film critics by any stance of the imagination, but I think if you're providing feedback in regards to a film, it's important to talk about what you liked and didn't like in a yeah. in a constructive and clear way. And I think Phil did that in his post, so thank you, Phil. Yeah, I'll say because yeah, I I didn't get a chance to read it because I've been such a, uh, so freaking busy today, but uh, I seen. Scott's part of it been and a playboy today <laughs> yeah play a he play a. his playboy shirt on today <laughs> that's true i am all studded up baby <laughs> but uh yeah thank you very much phil because i re- always respect the hell out of your movie opinions even if i disagree with you on some of them like you always bring valid points and same with xander when he replied and gave us that yes. amazing feedback as well yes like, thank you xander yeah they both just gave us some incredible feedback on the show and yeah we greatly appreciate it and the fact that you guys take time out of your day to write us a freaking novel of feedback is just incredible. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really quite awesome. I really, yeah, I love it. And I'm dyslexic, so it's very difficult for me to write back. I find it extremely exhausting. I hate texting. I hate messaging. It's just draining for me. Uh, but I will be responding. I did respond to Sander already, but I will um, respond to Phil as well, because I just think that was so thoughtful. And the yes. fact that people listen and care, you know, it still strikes me as odd that people uh, tune in and check us out and listen to Scott and I's unsolicited opinion. Uh, shout out to Lance from The Horror Returns and Phil and Ryan for having me on their March Madness episode and for Lance letting everyone know that I think you're immature if you don't like remakes. Thanks, Lance. I really appreciate it. <laughs> that it didn't make things awkward at all you're the man thank you lance um it's probably because we didn't cover pet cemetery That's but true. i had such a good time on that show i know you did it last year scotty yes um what you know they the horror returns is a fabulous podcast they run things so polishedly uh we talked about best worst movies and you'll have to listen to see who who won we'll be sharing it to our page for sure but we had a studded uh lineup we had pedro uh who is from l.a we had, oh, of course, Lance and Brian and Phil, as well as we had Carl, as well as we had uh, Cindy, who's from Women in Color um, for, for in horror. And everyone shared different perspectives, so it was a really good time. Yeah, I, I am so looking forward to listening to that episode because, yeah, when I did it last year, it was just a lot of fun, just a lot of people just shooting the shit, and it brought podcasters from all over together and that was uh like i was mentioning when in the post like that was where tim davis and i first started actually chatting by voice not just through like random messages here and there so like like, that was kind of where our friendship started so would you say that that's where the love affair began yes that is pretty much uh when i got all hot and bothered when i heard his sexy aussie voice all right, so I'm going to take a picture of Scott right now because you guys, you got to see this man right now. He is so done up. And I'm trying, I actually stopped sharing the screen so I can take a screenshot of him. Um, honestly, he looks like a baller. Scott, do a pose. Let's have a pose here. There we go. Here he is. Yeah. So anyway, 
For all of you guys who are not aware, Scott had a big day today. I won't go into too much detail of it, but let's just say he was a busy man today. And he is just looking so darn dapper in his like outfit right now. <laughs> He's got this maroon dress shirt on. His beard is freshly trimmed. And he's just looking like he's like a playboy, like he's going to go to the Playboy Mansion later. Do you have plans to go <laughs> see bunnies later, Scott? Is that what you're doing? I mean, damn straight. I'm, I'm going to be taken into the new position of Hugh Hefner. Oh, that's right. You'd be so funny as Hugh Hefner. Be like, <laughs> hey, do, you guys, do you guys like horror movies? And do you like video games? Because my name's Scott Crawford. And do you guys know how much my pro magic? <laughs> I was just going to say that, too. <laughs> uh, speaking of that, uh, but, we should probably talk about our biggest, uh, our newest adventure. Yes, if we shall. Uh, do you want me to go ahead and bring it up? You go ahead and bring it up, you dapper man, you. Oh, uh, you. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so, yes, um, by the time this episode comes out, we should hopefully have our very first episode of Controllers Up, Cards Down, the all-star gaming podcast, which is a once a month show with me, Heather, and some of you may remember him from the podcast by the cemetery, but Tim, he is joining us. Uh, this will be once a month show where we are basically just going to be doing, uh, talking about all things gaming, not video, not just video games, but we're talking board games, card games, tabletop games, trivia games, we're wanting to cover games, it all. You play in relationships. Just kidding. We're not yeah. talking about those games. Find <laughs> games. <laughs> but yeah, we're covering it all. Um, and we want to also have a rotating guest on every single episode to bring a different perspective in a different game that they like to talk about and share it. So we're we've already got a couple people interested in the show, which is awesome. Uh, but yeah, we've already got someone that wants that plays D and D. That's going to come on and talk about D and D. We got someone that's a big fan of some certain board games. They're going to talk about that. We got all sorts like retro gaming. We're going to probably talk about Magic since Tim and I both play Magic. It's yeah, but it's a three act podcast where we're basically just going to be doing news, re uh, news and releases for all games. Uh, we're going to have a second segment, which is. Uh, brought to us by the wonderful Miss Heather Powell. Uh, what is that? It's Retro Table. And we're going to be looking at the TV show, the can famous Canadian TV show, Video and Arcade Top 10, that was on from 1991 to 2006. Yep. And then we're going to watch one episode and talk about that episode and like what they show and everything. And we you take a walk down memory lane. Yep, pretty much. Uh, and then our third segment, it's going to be kind of like our uh, what would you, first impressions, uh, like what we've been playing type deal. So it would be like reviews, uh, like when we could be playing a video game, a board game or whatever, we'll just talk about it there and just, you know, hopefully, uh, and we'll share trailers and like links to those things on our Facebook page, which yes, we also have a Facebook page called Controllers Up. Of course Up. we do. <laughs> Controllers Up, Cards Down, All-Star Gaming Podcast. Um, but yes, this is not only going to be an audio podcast, but this is also going to be a video podcast on YouTube. And thanks to our wonderful boss man himself, Bo Ransdale, Bo. he has put in a lot of awesome work and making the video look really cool with a lot of graphics and effects. Um, so yeah, we are going to be hopefully dropping that sometime this week. And I hope you guys listen and check it out. We would love to hear your feedback. It's going to be on its own feed on Legion, as far as I know, or it'll be under the Legion feed, one of the two. Yeah, but, but yeah, this is just like a fun little once a month project that we wanted to do to bring like something different to the network that's not that's not really talked about. And it, we wanted to be all inclusive by including all these different games. And that's not horror, because in all fairness, like, it's great that we all talk about horror, but sometimes you need a break. You need a break from horror. Yeah. <laughs> We're so awkward. This is like our first podcast all over again. I know, for, for some <laughs> reason, my internet has been acting stupid today. You know why? Because it knows what you've been up to today with your... They, it, see, the problem is you don't usually dress this nice when we record. Usually you don't have on this really nice dress shirt and like your beard's done and you're not even wearing your glasses, for goodness sake. Like, I, I don't even know who you are anymore. Are you even I, Scott Crawford? Or is this an impersonator? Is this the this body is, uh, This is the true embodiment of Smoke Show. This is, the Smoke Show has finally emerged. Um, and yeah. so a couple other shout outs that we should give is that we also did uh, Lost After Dark commentary with Mr. Bo. Yes, we did. Uh, that's been posted to the page. It was released first on Legion Patreon. So if you're not a Patreon member, get on that. Uh, but we also released it to our regular page as well as Scotty was on Exploding Heads this morning. Yes, I was. And oh boy, there were lots of exploding heads. I'll tell you pow, what. Pow, 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 pow. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they had me on as a guest. Uh, Mr. Brandon Orlick kept me a secret. Uh, so 
Dave and Christian were kind of guessing on who the... Well, Brandon only talks like two people, so they probably knew who it was. Well, Christian thought it was Jason Smith. Oh. And Dave actually had written in the notes on his phone that he showed on the screen, and he said, guest question mark, SC. So he knew it was me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was a freaking blast because that was the first time I've ever got to work with all three of them together. I've And it's, you know, I've talked about it before, but it's one of the shows that got me into podcasting, like and loving, loving horror podcasts. So it was just an honor to be on their show. And it was such a blast. We ended up reviewing The Babadook and Son. And yeah, it was just lots of jokes being had, like in typical Exploding Heads fashion. And, uh, you know, us making fun of Brandon because it's Brandon. Because <laughs> it's Brandon. That's what he's there for. Exactly. But yeah, I want to say thank you guys for having me on because that was just an absolute freaking blast. Uh, and also, because uh, Scotty has been busy this week with lots of stuff. So I ended up uh, mm-hmm. also... Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I ended up also releasing a, uh, or it also just got released this week, the Psychosemantic Podcast with Darren. We ended up talking uh, The Watchmen and just talking random things. And we pretty much just went on a million different tangents. And that was such a blast. So I hope you guys listen to that as well. Yes. So now that we're done telling you how amazing we are on all our other podcasts. (laughs) And how you should listen to only us and just us. um, We'll break into our 2021 watches. We don't have a lot this week because... Uh, Scott and I doubled down on remakes and decided that was a good idea. And Scotty did watch more, but I told him he wasn't allowed to share them until I watched them. So it's it's a yeah. small list this week, but it's a mighty list. Um, because the first one is almost, what is it, four hours in length? Uh, four and a half hours. So the first one on our 2020 list is In the Search of Darkness Part 2. Uh, this is a documentary that just dropped. And if for those of you who watched In the Search of Darkness last year, you'll remember that they talked, I would say, basically the heavy hitters, right? Like yeah. it was it was probably the big franchisees that uh, people had heard of before. And In the Search of Darkness 2, they went way deep. Like they talked about like, um, what's that one that we had to watch on not uh, The Horror Returns? About the castle oh ah, uh, the keep the keep <laughs> the keep was on there for example and this hasn't had an official release on a channel yet i assume it's eventually going to be on shutter yeah I, yeah I believe uh it's dropping on shutter at the end of april from what i heard end of april it is totally worth the watch but it is a very long watch at 263 minutes in length so it does take some time to get through did you want to share some thoughts on it scotty yeah i uh because i like you and i both were watching this and like holy crap like they go deep with a lot of these films like you know i've heard of a lot of this stuff like growing up but like there is shit that i on this that they go into that i've never even heard of Or like, and like, I actually wrote down, like started writing down the list, like I don't have on me right now, but I've been actually writing down the list so I can check these movies out. Cause like, there's a bunch of cool ones from these like eighties films that I've never seen before. And they dive pretty deep into Italian horror too, which they just kind of scratched the surface of on the first movie. So like, yeah, they just, and they had like new guests on some more of the same guests from the last time, but all sorts, yeah, all sorts of movies were brought up and talked about in this and like they fantastic documentary. This is this was incredible, especially if you're going to go for four and a half hours. That is a hard task to keep someone invested for that long. And mm-hmm. I was invested from beginning to end. I just soaked all this up. Yeah, it was, um, it's it's really, it's a really solid documentary. I think it'll be hard for any other documentaries to knock this off the uh the top tier. So please check it out when it drops on Shutter. Uh, the next one, I'll let Scotty talk about that one. Scotty. All right. So the next one uh, is Sun from 2021. Uh, and the synopsis is when a young boy contracts a mysterious illness, his mother must decide how far she will go to protect him from terrifying forces in her past. Uh, the stars Andy Matichek and Emil Hirsch. Um, I really did enjoy this movie. Uh, I actually talk about it on the Exploding Heads podcast because that was the one we reviewed. Uh, I like when I went into it because I watched it twice once to watch it for this and then once to watch it for their show with more attention being paid to it. And both times I came out really liking it. Then I go on to Exploding Heads and some very astute points were brought up by Brandon, Dave, and Christian that I didn't catch that kind of brought it down for me. But I still, in general, enjoyed this like and thought it's worth watching because it's 
it's pretty uh twisted especially with the ending the way it way it all plays out i wasn't a big fan of this scotty knows this um i think it's a well-acted film i think it's a well-made film the story for me was just lacking for me personally i don't think it's a bad story i actually don't i think it's actually a pretty good story i just didn't love it uh it hasn't dropped officially yet anywhere so it's just screeners but i'm pretty sure this is going to be uh the youtube prime google play areas that you can find this movie is that correct scott do you know anything different um yeah i believe it's actually available now on prime like because uh because you know how well it's, it's not heads coming are. up here well, maybe not in Canadian Prime. Maybe let me, let me I look get at... I check Letterbox all the time. Scott, oh, that, that's to right. See if it's on Prime, yeah, I'm checking right now. Because uh, if it's not on Prime, just like Shows Bids Pizza and Chuck E. Cheese, which by the way has affected a lot of people, they're pretty fresh that. to know that Chuck E. Cheese was before Shows Show Bids Pizza. But which shows also the popularity of Showbiz Pizza for us in the U.S. <laughs> yes, for you, you people, in, you people, <laughs> you people. It's on Amazon for rent, son? Yes. Okay. So you can rent it on Amazon if you choose to. I would say probably no more than a three ninety nine rental in my opinion. Yeah, and I would say three ninety nine to five ninety nine, I would be I would say go for it. Some he's people only may saying like that guy's because he's wearing a dress shirt and he's suave now and he's a baller. <laughs> Okay, well, don't you know, on, only the most suave and dapper podcasters will recommend this movie. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> yes. Uh, the next movie is a foreign film and it is called The Lift or El Sendor. It is more science fiction y than it is anything else. Have you seen this one, Scotty? Nope, this is one I did not get a chance to get to this week. Yeah, well, la da. Look at that. <laughs> um, so, this movie is basically about a couple who, on their anniversary, have this fight that play over and over again in the elevator until they realize they're in a time warp and things are not what they seem let's it is very- do the time warp again. and then they break in the song and that's just how it goes uh it's definitely something that uh it's small cast there's literally two of them in one voiceover so i will give the two actors credit because they really do have to play off each other the entire time which i do think shows some pretty good talent uh, it is available on Prime for free. It is included. So I definitely recommend it as a free watch. It's a 70-minute runtime, so you're not going to waste a lot of time with it. Uh, do I think it's overly horror? No, I don't. I think it's more science fiction. Uh, there's one kind of horror scene to it, but it's fun. It's a really fun movie, and there's some really clever dialogue, so I'd recommend checking it out. Yep, I hope to watch this one really soon. And we found something out with this one. This one is only available on Canadian Prime right oh, now. Oh, that's right. It's not wow. available for us yet. For once, Canada's got something before us. For once. It will probably be available on YouTube, Google Play, iTunes, so you could probably find it from those areas. Yep. Uh, you know, just because it's not a prime exclusive, I don't think. So it, it should be available on other means. Yep. I'd say, like, uh, yeah, I'm definitely going to be trying to watch this soon just to check it out because I hear it's interesting. It is interesting. I think you'll enjoy it. Scotty. I will. Hmm. Dapper Scotty. Dapper man. You if know. you can, like, lower yourself to us of the commoners, yes, that would be hmm. nice. I will bring myself back down. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I guess we could jump on to this is give a shock, everyone. The final 2021 movie. I know for this sure. episode. <laughs> People are like, but why is that the The rest of the movies uh, are remakes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We did this all for you, podcast listeners. It was all it's like us at the top of the building. <laughs> it's Ch- all for you. All for Friday nightmares. <laughs> 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 anyway sorry Scott. all right so the final movie for our 2021 watches is safer at home two years into the pandemic a group of friends throw an online party with a night of games drinking and drugs after taking an ecstasy pill things go terribly wrong and the safety of their homes become more terrifying than the raging chaos outside man this movie very realistic and hit home pretty hard. Mm-hmm. Scott does a lot of E, so it was yes. really affecting <laughs> him a lot. <laughs> God damn it. He's like, stop it. My mom listens to this podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's an 82 minute run time. I believe this is coming to Shutter, isn't it? Uh, no, I think this one is on 
Prime. Is it on Prime? Okay. So yeah, Letterbox isn't up to date. Usually they're pretty good with telling me where to watch things, but I'm not seeing that with these. Uh, some people have been really harsh on this movie. I, I think because they were thinking, oh, it just ripped off Host. This is nothing like Host besides you no. consume like that is the only thing that is similar the the concepts are very different and it's a very hard look at the pandemic so i kind of want to give a little bit of a warning warning here if you are feeling high in anxiety about covid19 we are a year into covid19 um well the effects of covid19 and some and you are somewhere where perhaps you know there's curfews in place or where there's um a higher amount of fear or concern perhaps this movie may be something you should skip over for now yeah i was um, going to give that disclaimer because yeah this is very realistic and like i said it's going to make some people like really uncomfortable and yes raise their anxiety yes so i i very well done though extremely well acted well written well delivered especially through zoom uh screens which is how it's filmed uh yeah. i personally think it did a better job of doing that than the host did i think the host was first and it has the I, host to thank for doing that but this is pretty good yeah because i was gonna say i like the way this is done because this feels more like what you and i and other podcasters have done during this whole quarantine mm -hmm. pandemic where it says we're just getting on to shoot the shit and have fun and drink and just mm -hmm. chat like we're hanging out in person, but we're through our Zoom calls. Mm -hmm. And like, mm -hmm. that's what this is. It's just a bunch of friends that can't see each other are getting together because in this movie, the pandemic has been going on for two years now. And mm -hmm. like there is extremely strict curfews now where you can't leave your house at night mm -hmm. at all. And like, it's just like, yeah, like which we have in the province of Quebec or did. Oh, did you? OK. Yeah. Now, not to the extent that you got jailed. You got a ticket, right. right? Which is probably more effective because no one wants to pay a seven hundred fifty dollars fine, um, right? But yeah, like I, I have no. That's why I said there are places that have curfews that have yeah. implemented it, right? So it, it is, and it really does. This movie is very brave because it talks about the side effects of the pandemic and what it can do to people. And I think that takes a lot of courage, to be quite honest with you. Yeah, especially uh, because, right now. Especially, yeah, because we're right in the middle of it. Um, but yeah, I, I think this movie is excellent. I think it's really well done. I think it's an excellent horror suspense film. Uh, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Do I think it's top 10 material? No, but I think it definitely deserves an acknowledgement at the end of the year. And who knows? It might be up for an award. Um, yeah. And we'll see. I, I could see it being on some people's top 10. Yeah, that's true. You know, maybe some people will put it on their top 10. I guess I just think of like certain podcasters and I know that they would yeah. put it on their top 10. But I wouldn't say this is the worst movie I've ever watched, but you got to like social media horror yeah. and you got to be down with the whole Zoom unfriended, like, you know, host kind of theme. If you like that, you'll like this. If you didn't like that, you're probably not going to like this. Or if you've done on that in COVID, you're probably not going to like this. So just know that going into it. Yep. And I did look and yes, it's available to rent on Amazon right now. Excellent. And I think it's worth the price. Whatever you paid yeah. rent it, I think it's worth it. Yeah, this is this is definitely like one I was really impressed with. And I'll give you a little sneak peek. But uh, Tim, uh, he was watching it with me. And like when things started going down, he turned his back to the screen and just played on his phone because he's like, nope, I can't do this. This is too much. This is making me way too anxious. So like and that, that and nothing to, to show, do with like, Scott staring at him being like we're in this together right tim oh, staring at him what do you mean i had my arms wrapped around him and pulling like, him close we're safe there at home <laughs> Shh. let it happen tim <laughs> it was like i need an adult <laughs> um and it's because you know you just want you couldn't find one of your cats so you had to snuggle him at the exactly time. i needed i needed a cuddle buddy he is somebody <laughs> um so yeah we definitely recommend it and that's it for 2021 watches but don't worry we will be back in the saddle soon. Yeah, uh, giggity, giggity. I did watch like uh, some of the ones that Scott had suggested. So I did watch uh, Willie's Wonderland, which I did think was really funny, Scott. You were right. That one yeah. was quite entertaining. And I blame society. So I did manage to catch up with him on some stuff that he had watched that I had missed. Um, but yeah, definitely I enjoyed Willy, Willy's Wonderland. Nick's Cage, less annoying role is what I'll say for that. It, one. Yes, yes, a very, very good point. Like he didn't, he wasn't super annoying. And I do enjoy animatronics to come alive. I, I do find that really funny, actually. Um, yeah, I knew that would movie. be, I knew that would be one you would have a lot of fun All with. Right, it's a good movie. It was nice to turn your brain off. Yeah. 
So for older watches, uh, there's two on here. One was a movie that sadly just left Prime, so you're going to have to find it through other means, but it was called Stag Night. And this year, I've been checking out some subway horror. horror. So hmm. I don't know if you're aware, Scott, but there's a lot of movies about horror that occurs in a subway. I saw one earlier this year called Creep. I'm sure you remember the scene in the uh, the first, um, oh my goodness, the one where Art the Clown came out in All Hallows Eve. Oh, yeah, All Hallows Eve, yep. Right? The first one was in, the first story was in a subway. And and then this one called Stag Night. Basically, it's a, a group of dudes that are out for Stag Night and their buddies getting married and so last night on the town they catch the last uh subway train something happens on the train they end up getting off at a stop where no one is there and then chaos occurs and Ooh. it's a pretty gory film and wow really and it's the ending is a little similar to the movie creep that i watched that was also about um a subway uh or not subway the restaurant by the way subway <laughs> as in the subway, subway eat fresh but this was a pretty good film. I actually really, really enjoyed it. And I would definitely recommend checking it out. Unfortunately, it has left Canadian Prime, but it may still be on American Prime. Uh, it's definitely a two ninety nine or one ninety nine rental. Uh, and it's an 84 minute runtime came out in 2008. So if you miss this gem and you enjoy kind of like, a, I would say sign of a survival horror, then it's definitely up your alley and cannibalism. If you dig cannibalism. You'll probably dig this movie. So it looks like a uh, yep. Stag Night is on Prime in the U.S. Is it still on Prime in the U.S.? Awesome. Yep. So yeah, if you're looking for something older and fun, and then Harbringer Down um, is a night is a 2015 movie, 82 minutes in length. I watched this movie, and at first I'm like, oh man, this is going to be the biggest piece of crap that has ever existed. It's it's going to be horrible. It wasn't. Man, was this not a piece of crap. And it's available on Tubi. Nice. Yeah, because I, I remember why. Because I think you mentioned it to me. I'm going, that movie sounds familiar. I remember why. This, the effects crew from the Thing prequel that came out in 2011, uh, they, were the, they were the ones that did all the effects for the Thing creature in that. And when Universal got it and got their hands on it, they completely covered all of their work with CGI. So you couldn't even see any of their animatronics they made. So they were pretty upset, which I don't blame them, and actually decided to direct their own movie, which ended up being Harbinger Down. Where they were able... Harbinger Down? I yep. said it wrong then. Harbinger Down. And and yeah, they ended up making this movie to uh, show off their special effects. And let me stuff. tell you, they certainly do. Like I was watching this film, and I was like, ah, the acting's like okay, all right. And then the special effects happened, and I was like, oh my god, <laughs> I will have to what? watch this. Like, I was like, I I was seriously like, is this the same film? Like, how, how did they get these special effects? Because it was, it was fucking crazy. Like, it was nuts how good these special effects were. And, you know, for the movie, like, you're watching this movie and I'm like, wow, this is like thing quality, but not the thing. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that was like, I, that's makes, I definitely will have to watch this thing because, yeah, I, for some reason, it just slipped my mind what the name of this was. And I really do think it's uh, uh, Lovecraftian, but you can watch it and tell me. Yeah, uh, if it has, like, creatures similar to the thing, then, yeah, that's Lovecraft because even the, the thing is Lovecraftian. Okay, so it is, it, the acting is so-so, but the special effects make up for this. And it's a free watch on Tubi. So I definitely recommend it. And it was definitely a, a dark horse that I did not see coming. So check it out if you get a chance to. Nice. Yeah, I'm definitely going to check that one out then. And uh, I was trying to go, uh, I'll jump into my older watches, but I was trying to go with our theme for the episode and doing originals and remakes. I unfortunately did not get a chance to get to the remake of this one yet, but I decided to watch the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Which is what we think has happened to Scott today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's the Invasion of the Smoke Show. <laughs> but, uh, yep, from 1954. And it's a small town doctor learns that the population of his community is being replaced by emotionless alien duplicates. Man, I you know, I am not the biggest fan of, like, these older 50s movies. Holy shit. The performances in this were incredible. And for, you know, the original story is like a hokey B-movie plot, like sci-fi B-movie mm -hmm. plot with this. Mm -hmm. But man, the story was really good. The acting was great. Had some pretty creepy elements. And like, I just all around really dug this film a lot. And like, 
I I was completely shocked because I thought I would just be like, oh, I can respect it, but you know, it's not my kind of jam. No, this is something I will go back and rewatch at some point because this was just really, really well done. Like, and it was super easy to watch. I got to check this out because we watched another 1950 movie on here that I did not think I was going to enjoy. I was dreading watching it, and I dug it. For, yeah, and I yeah, I think you will really, really dig this one as well. Like, I think I will too. It's really well done. And uh, hopefully by the next episode, I will have watched the 70s Invasion of the Body Snatchers remake with uh, uh, Donald Sutherland. Yeah. Ow! I'm like, bite my fist how he was in the 70s. <laughs> Damn. Mm, and I was I've, born in the wrong generation. Apparently Chris so. Chris Sarandon and Donald Sutherland. I had boyfriends from the 1970s and 80s. I don't even know them. <laughs> and have you seen the remake from the 70s? No, I haven't. Okay, because I have not either. And I'm very curious on that one. I've heard so many good things. Yeah, I've heard it's really good. I hear both are good so yeah yep no uh, well then yeah i'll jump into the next one which i'm just kind of kind of lump these together because it's all just kind of one long story but it's uh i will basically say the annabelle trilogy so annabelle annabelle creation and annabelle comes home i finally i i'm only missing one movie now from the whole conjuring wannaverse or whatever you want to call it so i will get to that at some point as well but yeah i decided to finally watch all three What's of the one these you're missing the chris uh, Lorna. yep yeah that's the only one i haven't seen yet yeah um but Wow, I was pretty impressed with this little trilogy here. Like, yeah, I think it's a great introductory to horror trilogy. People, absolutely. Uh, did you listen to the Exploding Heads podcast? Review it with I Lacey sure. Lou and Carly. I sure did. And yeah, they did a good job of reviewing it. I didn't agree with all their points, but they did a very good job of talking about it. Yes, and I am uh, com- in a complete agreement with Brandon that Annabelle Comes Home is my favorite. Mm-hmm. I just loved that one because it just brought in all these different supernatural creatures and like it was all just done in the house mm-hmm. and had some really good effective scares like and mm-hmm. it was like you said it's a perfect introductory trilogy to horror for someone that's new to horror Absolutely. And I don't get the complaints about like I don't understand the hate the first Annabelle gets because I think that was a pretty decent little uh, spin off and Annabelle Creation was a period piece, which was really well done with the yeah. telling of the prequel story. Very like, strong film. Yeah, I was very, very impressed with this little trilogy. Like, I. I went in thinking, oh, I'm not going to enjoy any of these. And yeah, came out very pleasantly surprised. Like, they were all fun. You know, it's funny because I really. I wish I had watched them in the order that they are actually made in, in or how the story goes. Yes. I wish I had seen Creation first, followed up by Annabelle, followed up by Annabelle Comes Home. I really do have a beef with how they were released. I think that you're at a deficit if you watch it not in that order because they flow into each other fairly well. And now they do a good job in each movie of showing a clip from the previous film. Yeah. Like they do connect them. I will give them credit for that. I just think that a lot of people shit on this series because they don't follow the storyline as how it goes. And yes, it is light horror. I know it's rated R as Exploding Heads talked about, but I feel like it's a light rated R. Like I don't, I would never watch either of these movies and be like, oh man, like kids couldn't handle this. Probably I was honestly shocked to find out they were rated R because I just assumed they were PG-13. Well, and I, and Dave C made an excellent point. I just listened to the podcast today. So, which is why it's so fresh in my head. Uh, Dave C made a point about how, you know, no one wants to make that PG-13 movie. So they made it rated R so that they could basically get more people watching it. And honestly, that's a real shame because I don't think it needed to be rated R. I I think it was absolutely fine being a PG-13 movie. And I really wish people would get off their high little horror horse and not like, and have this beef against PG-13 fucking horror movies. Like it's so juvenile. See, there's something else you can tell people, Lance. Tell people I think that they're juvenile if they don't like, if they criticize PG-13 movies. Um, I will will say, I used to be one of those like, oh, PG horror, PG-13 horror is stupid. And then I'm looking at like, when I'm, you know, doing like the first time watches and then, you know, stuff that I did before, you know, we did the show and watch it. I'm going, they're not stupid at all. They are just a different kind of horror that don't need to be blood and guts and swearing and nudity. Or maybe it's, it's just, just an entry level. Like maybe you don't yeah. want your kid watching that to start off with, or maybe someone has a lighter stomach or they don't like swearing. Like 
anyway, I, I think the Annabelle series is is quite good. I think that it's, you know, I don't put it up there as one of the best series of all time, but no. I think as an entry gateway horror, I think those three films are great gateway horror. I, I really do. I think they're easy. They're consumable. Um, you, you're not exhausted when you get out of them. They're decent run times and they're quick and yes. they do the job. They do some decent jump scares. Yes, there's some like shitty things and stupid things that happen in the movies. That happens in every single fucking horror movie. Like, you know, it's it's you kind of got to forgive certain things or you wouldn't have a plot line. But yeah, I'm glad you I'm glad you dug them and I'm glad you're halfway or more than halfway now. I guess just one movie left for the Wanda universe or the Conjuring universe or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I'll say I'm slowly just trying to knock out all these different franchises and universes that are being made, apparently, and just kind of just like build my horror cred, if you will. Oh, man. <laughs> and with this mauve shirt, I'm sharing that picture to our page later. Do it. <laughs> like, everyone's got to know what the smoke show is packing. Here we are, a year into quarantine, and Scott's like, I got this shit, bitches. You see this? <laughs> this. you missing out. You had your chance with Scotty. You missed it. You missed it. And yeah. I'm in the background going, yeah. Down. Yeah, that's Keep my down, girl. That's all my role. That's all I do is I just yell <laughs> yeah in the back. You're my hype man. Uh, yeah, I'm your hype man. That's it. That's the only role I have. <laughs> just so we're clear. <laughs> so what we've been listening to. So I have been binging on short bus cinema with yes. Ricky Morgan and uh, John Kruger. And oh my God, these guys are hilarious. This show is available on the Legion Podcast Network. It they cover all sorts of movies, and they just make fun of the movie. And I like, like, I feel like I'm in love with Ricky Morgan, but not in love with Ricky <laughs> Morgan. Does that make sense? Ricky Morgan is a happily married man, so I don't want to come across like I'm creepy. But I like, like, I'm totally like a Ricky Morgan, like Ricky, Ricky fan girl. Like, I really am. Like, I could get a T-shirt that says "I Heart Ricky." He's, he's one of my man crushes, isn't he? He's just and his accent. Okay, he has like the funniest southern accent in the entire world. One of my favorite episodes so far, Short Bus Cinema, is where they talk about the Kiss movie, where Kiss centers a theme park and they're going to yes. play this concert. It's like Phantom of the Kiss. Yeah, Phantom of the Park. Oh my God. Him making fun of that movie is hilarious. And dude can sing. Yes. Oh, have you? Did you ever find that Kiss song that he covered? Um, he sent it to me actually. Oh, it is so like, good. I don't want to brag or anything, but Ricky and I are pretty close. It's because Ricky is a badass. Right? Like, he's he's like, Heather, you're a cool chick. I'm like, I know, I am. And he's like, I'm going to send you pictures of me and my band or videos of me and my band singing. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, he's got uh, an incredible voice. Oh, man. Like, <laughs> like really good. I was like, Ricky, what the fuck are you not doing in music? Uh, like, like professionally. You're good enough right. that you could be at that, that level. So if you, if you enjoy having some good laughs, you love hearing two dudes make fun of a movie that's absolutely ridiculous please check out show bus cinema on the legion podcast network yes that is a great show so much fun um pretty much anything ricky does i just freaking love because his personality just gets you so hyped even if it's for one of the most terrible movies in the world he just gets you so hyped about it because just the way totally. he talks about it, it just he's he, it's infectious the way he talks. His energy is contagious. It absolutely is, and I freaking love the man. Um, but yeah, the show that I am going to talk about is also on the Legion Podcast Network, and that is the Mystery Vault Podcast, which at this moment has released four episodes, but it is hosted by it is a solo cast hosted by RJ McCready from Bite Size Cinema. And he basically is covering pretty much all these different mysteries. Uh, he's starting off with cryptids, so like Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster, and just kind of going really far in depth, doing a lot of research and finding all this information to present on the podcast. Uh, and I love listening about these urban legends and crypt like basically cryptids. I love hearing this stuff. So uh, it's awesome that he decided to do this show. And plus... He's Australian, so I think he's Australian in that accent. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I definitely recommend this podcast. I have binged all four episodes so far. Uh, I am really digging it, and I cannot wait for the next one. Um, and he's going to go into even more uh, lesser known mysteries like that won't be really involving cryptids, but he's been like, like saying there'll be a lot more just like deep dives of things that people may not have heard about before. So I'm excited to find out what those are because I just love hearing this type of stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. It's uh, and it's nice to see these new uh, podcasts. Also, you know, the, uh, 
the controllers up cards down all-star gaming podcast coming to uh the legion podcast network yes <laughs> giving us a nice variety on the network that's for sure that's true and you know scott and i are our leaders in that so we just have to make sure we let everybody know how awesome we are right scotty that's right and i was saying i mean i mean look at us look how awesome we are like look at the mobe shirt don't worry you guys will all see it i'll share i'll send it to the page and you'll see this amazing shirt that scotty is wearing right now uh, but please check out our uh, all joking aside please check out all the awesome podcasts on the legion network and please hit subscribe on whether it's Podbean, uh stitcher apple itunes podcast google play whatever it is i think google plays the, the podcast yep. feed yeah um please subscribe to legion podcast network we have tons of stuff out there for you to listen to um but in the meantime why don't we hear from our one of our fellow legion friends so after these messages we'll be right back are you sick of the same old stale podcast well then join vanessa and darren as they dissect movies of all kinds the two lifelong cinema lovers bring their favorites curiosities and first-time watches to the operating table and inject them with a healthy dose of snark. Then there's the waiting room where they examine books and short stories. So just look for them on Apple Podcasts and where fine podcasts are available. They're part of the Legion Podcast Network. Follow them on Twitter at VD Clinic Pod. Join them on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash VD Clinic Pod. Or email them at VD Clinic Pod at gmail.com. They're ready to cure what ails you. <laughs> and still, they just might be a little contagious. Welcome back. And our main topic today is going to be on remakes. Now, if you've listened to our franchise episode, which we did previously, there was an article where we talked about uh, why people do remakes. So if you haven't listened to that yet, I would encourage you to go back. If you're like, no, Heather, you can't tell me what to do. The the short form of what the articles talked about is remakes are made for a couple of main reasons. One is to keep rights to films. So in order to avoid losing rights, you, you do remake to keep them. Uh, another reason is because they're usually a sure cash grab and there's nothing wrong with making money people so if you're going to make, make a remake dollar 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 dolla, um that way you know that you will have a steady income coming through for the remakes might allow you to fund other projects down the road or you might just have a really creative idea to take a remake or take a movie that was made at a certain time mm -hmm. and bring it into a new time period and to get new fans interested in the genre so if you're interested in learning more about those articles, including some links to some lectures by a professor that talks about the value of remakes, then you can go back to our previous episode and listen to that. If not, or you can listen to it when you're done here, whatever you do you. But Scotty is going to take us into our first film who really did uh, take a new look at this film when it was remade in the 80s. So Scotty, why don't you start us off? The first movie for our topic tonight is going to be The Thing from Another World, which was initially released on April 6th, 1951. The synopsis is, the crew of a remote Arctic base fights off a murderous monster from outer space. Then we are going to also talk about its remake, The Thing, uh, released June 25th, 1982. In remote Antarctica, a group of American research scientists are disturbed at their base camp by a helicopter shooting at a sled dog. When they take in the dog, it brutally attacks both human beings and canines in the camp, and they discover the beast can assume the shape of its victims. A resourceful helicopter pilot and the camp doctor lead the camp crew in a desperate, gory battle against the vicious creature before it picks them all off one by one. Now, right off the bat, I'm going to look at the synopsis. They're making it sound like the dog is the monster throughout the whole movie. No, the dog is not. Dog is just one Spoiler! Part. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the dog is the catalyst let's just say so sorry are you done reading the synopsis yeah okay sorry <laughs> i got excited to talk about the thing from another world which i never thought i'd be so excited to talk about a movie from 1951 right but i totally am so 
I have been notorious for criticizing people who don't like remakes. And I have been like, well, the thing's so popular. What about the thing from another world? Assuming that I was going to walk into the thing from another world thinking it was a piece of shit. Like, I just assumed I was not going to like it. And nothing could be further from the truth. (laughs) I loved this movie. Like, I loved the thing from another world. And I, I think what I really appreciated about this movie is, A, it's made in 1951. The dialogue in this movie was entertaining as anything. Yes. And the acting was incredible. It was incredible. And we got to remember how things are filmed in 1951. They don't have the wide end lenses. They don't have all the tricks and and stuff that they had in 1982. This is a 30 year gap. Yes. Between when these movies were made and the, the way that, so we, we have the opening scene where a journalist, Ned Scott, shows up um, at an Air Force club where he meets these other Air Force Army men. And it's very typical, like, you know, I guess you could argue it's sexist conversations. Yeah, but she's mo talk. You can, you can forgive. It's 1951. Like, you can't, it is what it is. That just it's, part, it's, it's a product of its time. It's a product of its time, right? But it was really built the relationships between the gentlemen that were there. When they go up to the landing, which is Antarctica, they or Arctic, the Arctic base or whatever it is, they there's two women there that are definitely strong roles. Yeah. They're not just this there for eye candy. Like they have a strong role. There's even a great banter between one of the females and the main captain. Because I guess they had had a romantic affair. She had pieced. And they went back and forth with each other. And it was really awesome. Like, I really enjoyed the dialogue and the way she interacted with him. Like, it, you you bought into everybody's character. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Like, because uh, just like you, I also went into this going, oh, this is just going to be hokey and cheesy. Like, a lot of the, because a lot of the 50s sci-fi B-movie style movies from that time are mm-hmm. just that. They're hokey, cheesy, probably worth, you know, entertain- a little bit of entertainment. But, like, I didn't expect this to actually be as good and like as well done and well acted and also just like the story like or the filming like when they see the 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 saucer which was something that happened in the thing remake by the way yeah the whole like viewing of the area and they walk around they're like oh my god and they kind of stand in a big circle and they're like we found it we found a saucer their excitement seems legitimate like they are actually very excited to find this this item and they take it back to the camp and they store it and then weird shit starts to happen. And the special effects, there's one scene where they're where the thing they try to burn it, which is a theme of what they do in the remake. And the fire where this stunt man got caught on fire in 1951 is incredible. Yes. I think like I was telling you when I watched this that I thought like the fire stunt in this is is good or better than a lot of the fire stuff it holds that have up been today done. yeah it's incredible what they did with it and like because he's not like it's not easy being a stunt man and being caught on fire and being able to like control your movements and you know do it without panicking mm-hmm. and doing something like that especially at that time where it was probably like nowadays they probably have more ways of putting out the fire fast where mm-hmm. back then it might have just been like a fire extinguisher or like putting well and the whole set on cuts you. on fire yeah they catch a whole bunch of shit on fire yeah like this it's incredible what they did with this and now we had fire in the 1982 remake and let's make this clear i'm not taking anything away from the 1982 remake the 1982 remake special effects are out of this world but I'm sorry, I find the fire scene in 1951 way more impressive just because of how much more difficult that would have been to do in yeah, 1951. Because the 1982's version, they are catching special effects on fire, like yes. handmade th- things, where it's not a human in costume. It's each that yes. stuff on fire and not have to worry. Yes. But you're worrying about a human life cover, like a stuntman's human life. Just, yeah. Um, Running in flames. You know, I do just want to bring up like... flames. It was yes. crazy. Yeah, it's insane. And, you know, obviously there is a lot of well-deserved fucking love for the 82 version because of everything this movie had did. Um, That is the one thing I like about the remake better than the original is the creature in this remake is completely different. Yes. To the, where it is basically turns into like a whodunit because yes. each, because you, it builds up a level of 
paranoia when you're already isolated and trapped in a cold winter yes. where there is no paranoia in the first movie no. of who is no. who because you know who everybody is in that movie yeah and and no one is th- like the creature is the creature right the creature is walking around in a suit yeah right and um there's one guy that's obsessed with the creature and has that one scene where he's like no no we won't hurt you we want to learn from him and the creature's like fuck that <laughs> right right, <laughs> right? Wow. and um but i agree i think what uh the remake did really well is it's definitely played on the isolation factor of it played on who you did not know who the thing could be. This is a situation where I really think they respected the original, even with like the subtle little things like breaking the window. Um, They broke the window in the first one to keep the room cool. And the window was broken in in the remake to kind of deal with shooting the dog or whatever it was. There was something that was the aggravator at the beginning where they were shooting. Yep. The Norwegian pilot, the Norwegian pilot. Um, And then the dog comes in and the scene where the dog walks into the kennel, area with oh, all the other dogs is extremely well done the special effects there and the practicality of it is out of this world good and as much as i do respect kurt russell as an actor and i'm not insulting him when i say this he kind of is the same person in a lot of movies like yeah. he's angry and you know standoffish and smart ashes but he plays it well and he plays it well here you know you definitely um know that he's kind of the smart one of the group and people think he's the thing and he's not the thing and he ties them all up and those scenes are great uh and i can definitely see why the thing from another world was remade but i really have a lot of value for that original one that i didn't think i was gonna have yep same here like my undying love for the thing from 1982 i was having a heart i was gonna be like am i going to be able to go back now and watch this the original one and enjoy it as a separate movie or am I going to be like, oh, the 82 version's better, blah, blah, blah. No, I it's different. It's so different while still being the same. Pretty much they just kept the setting and the story idea. Yeah, and, there was some definitely, and there was some there was some great callbacks, right? Like the yeah. fire scene, the breaking of the and window. From what I heard. The finding John, the, the, flying the saucer, finding like the, the outline of the flying saucer. Like there was some great callbacks that they did yeah from what i heard john carpenter absolutely loves the thing from another world and that's why he wanted to remake it and a little uh little just nerdy thing for me to spout out here and i'm sure some others have noticed this but in the original halloween the thing from another world is playing on the tv when uh, Lori is babysitting the kids and the kids are watching it right after they went trick-or-treating that's interesting because i don't think a child would sit through that movie but that's okay <laughs> right um <laughs> But I, I think one of my favorite things at the end of The Thing from Another World, and I just want to point this out because I really like the ending. Of course, it's a happy ending as opposed to The Thing, which you kind of know that is not a happy ending. Yeah. Um, but I love how the newscaster gets on to the, to the airway and he makes a comment about the captain's busy right now with other business. And it's because he's sitting with his, the girl that he's been reconnected with and they're chatting away. I thought it was really cute and classy. And his final lines are, tell the world, Tell this to everyone, wherever they are. Watch the skies everywhere. Keep looking. Keep watching the skies. And that was very much from the 1950s, right? That was very much the idea that we are not alone. There are aliens. They're coming. They're here. And I think what the thing the remake did was kind of embed that fear deeper. That they're here and they can be us and they're not going anywhere. And we can't predict who they are. We can't see who they are. You know, and the blood petri dishes, having to go through that kind of extremity to figure out who is the quote unquote thing um, was quite was quite smart. And, And the different characters that were in it. I feel like these movies are both very strong. I don't know if I prefer one over the other. I think they're both. I think this was a remake that should have been remade because it gave props to the original, but expanded on the story. And there was a big enough gap that you could do things that didn't need, that couldn't have been done in 1951. Now, mind you, I like all remakes or at least respect why remakes are made. Yeah. So I would say that about anything, but I don't think you could put one over top of the other here. I think they're both masterpieces and they deserve to be seen. Yep. I completely agree. And the fact that they are, they are both, different enough to where you don't even have to compare them like Mm -hmm. you don't even feel like you can compare them Mm -hmm. and they're both in you know they're both uh adaptations of the who goes there novel yeah which one of these days i would love to read because i want to see if the who goes there novel which one uh is closer to like the adaptation of it is like is the thing from another world more closer to the source or is the thing 1982 closer to the book source we talked about this in one of our episodes did we yeah we did and I can't remember which one it was. It was yeah, an early episode, and we talked about which the book was closer to. 
oh that's right yeah it was probably our it was in a research yeah it was like our aliens movie that we or aliens topic yeah so i think that uh, we did cover it and i can't remember at all yeah we've talked about a lot of movies at this point (laughs) but i'm glad that you and i are both on par in terms of how we felt about these these films because i think that they they both have a lot of value obviously like the special effects in 1982 still hold up today as well like watching that film it was like i don't think it could have got any better like definitely i understand you know you could probably do some different things now but the special effects were so fucking good yeah like, like um and it's just un- it's just unfortunate that, that film like did not get its heyday at its yeah. time in theaters though i'm glad that it's got no, it the... was up against et at the time because remember yeah. we talked about that and et was a family favorite we have a friendly alien where this was like we're all gonna fucking die in a <laughs> yeah it was very dark right very dark you know? and just dire <laughs> right it was a little bit different right so yeah but uh definitely i'm glad we watched both of them and i would recommend to anyone who hasn't seen them to watch them they they are yeah. definitely a piece of horror history science fiction history too probably more science fiction but you know what we'll adopt them into our horror family worth checking out absolutely yeah i i say if you have not seen either of them or only seen one of them go and search the other out because they are both well worth your time absolutely uh so yeah I, we can jump on to the next movie which is carrie from uh november 3rd 1976 on the day of her prom night, 17-year-old Carrie discovers that she possesses telekinetic powers. She puts her powers to use when she is humiliated after a prank. Uh, directed by Brian De Palma. Uh, and then the Carrie remake from October 18th, 2013. Carrie, an awkward teenager protected by a fanatical mother, becomes the butt of all jokes in school. When the pranks of her classmates go get out of hand, she unleashes her telekinetic powers among them wow um yeah this one these are not like you know i've seen the original carrie multiple times the carrie remake was a first for me i watched the made for tv carrie remake with angela bettis before and that was okay but um yeah this one is pretty close like they're both pretty similar Mm -hmm. um the only difference that i noticed is like that makes this more modern for the 2013 one is the cyber bullying by Mm -hmm. posting the humiliation of her in the beginning on social media and then posting it on the tv screen during the prom i would agree and i will tell you i noticed the difference between the remake being rejected by a woman and the original being directed by a man yes and i say that being a female and experiencing bullying and that locker scene was different that shower scene was different i like how you know if we compare the two shower scenes at the beginning or the you know carrie is playing volleyball and then goes into shower in the original randomly because that's what you did after volleyball i guess even though none of them were really that sweaty um being in the pool and then showering is a lot more normal she's very insecure and like can we just give chloe is chloe moretz Yep, Chloe, Gla- Chloe Grace Moretz. Like, fuck, man. Like, she nailed this role. Yeah. And so did Sissy Specs. Both yeah, were Sissy excellent. Spacey, yeah, they, they were both amazing. Both uh, excellent characters. Yeah, amazing lead roles. Um, I did love how the the thing is videotaped in the 19, or the 2013, which is very much what would happen. Yep. Uh, the bullying seems to be a little bit more intense, and she's on the sh- on the ground very very shook up what i thought was interesting in both versions the gym teacher slaps her uh yes. probably wouldn't happen now but i thought that was an interesting twist and i noticed that in the remake the one girl what's her name susie suzanne uh susie or was it chrissy chrissy but wasn't it susan in the other one uh, are you thinking the bully or the one that actually has the change of heart the one that has the quote-unquote change of heart yeah i think that was susie Susie. So in the original, um, I feel like she wasn't as as uh, sincere as the remake. I no. think the remake did a better job of making her seem more sincere. And I think that Carrie's interactions with her mother when talking about breasts and talking about how like the dirty pillows, her mom calls them the dirty pillows. Because there's 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 line for line copy over here. Yeah. You can tell the div- delivery is different being directed by a woman. There's just something about it that to me, I'm like, yeah, this is more female centric. Yeah, this is more of how it would be delivered. Not the sissy specs and deliver it well. And this is really something I think that maybe you would only catch on to if you were a heterosexual female. And I could be wrong in that. Maybe other people did too. But I really noticed it being different. Yeah, I did notice like slight differences. Like 
Uh, Because it felt like the original one was a little more unintentionally provocative in some ways. Yeah. Like, like, I don't think it was meant to be that. It was like, because obviously it was just supposed to show, like, show Sissy Spacek's character as just like, she's just... uh, She seems uh, more broken in the original. And she seems like naive and simple and slow. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for. Like delayed, I would say, what they were trying to present there. Um, Her relationship with her mother is a little bit more over the top. The mother is very, like, Julianne Moore did a great job of where you see the birth of Carrie and the resentment of her having the baby, but yet she keeps the baby. I thought that was an interesting tie-in to have at the beginning in the remake. And when... You know, and her mother believing that Carrie entering the time where she gets her period, which is pretty late for a female to get her period, which means that she was probably undernourished. Because 16, 17, which is as old as Carrie is, that's that's a long time before you get your period. I had my well, period I was saying age if, 14, 13. Like, that's... Right. And, right? like, you see with Sissy Spacek, like, she even looks malnourished. She does, right? She looks like, very Like, uh, Chloe Grace Moretz, not so much, no. but... Like she, like she doesn't even look like I think. Like that's the one thing I'll say is different. Like where, like obviously, bullying can take any shape and form, and anybody can be a victim of bullying. Mm-hmm. But like Sissy Spacek, like is that girl that I would see in my school that would just get picked on because she was so awkward. Extremely awkward, right? Now, mind you, she does to open up a little bit, but I found her having that normal conversation at the prom less likely than I felt in the remake. Yes. Because I felt like Carrie in the remake was just shy and was nervous, but I felt like she had more confidence and knowledge of how the world works. So when she felt comfortable enough to be at prom with um, with the gentleman that took her, it was more flowing. To, like, I believed it. I believed that she would be there having that kind of relaxed conversation Um and that she would be more in tune to what he was talking about and that it would be more flowing. What yep. relationship I preferred more in the original was Chris and Billy's. I think oh Dr. My Volchen, God. I felt like they overdid Billy in the remake to be a complete fucking psycho, which I did not care for. I feel like Billy in the original was just a, he was a dick, but he was just doing what he needed to do to make his hot girlfriend happy. Yeah, he was a he was the bad boy of the seventies, like that. Like that's yeah, like, but he wasn't and, abusive. Like, well, no, the, like their the their remake, relationship. The guy seems psycho. Yes, but I was gonna say like right? their relationship in the seventies one though felt very abusive, but almost like more abuse on him. Yeah, like she controlled him. Yes, and she manipulated him to get what she wanted. Yeah, and then was constantly right? like just belittle him over and over and over again. Right, and I I found that really. Interesting. I liked the gym teacher in both how she stood her ground and makes the girls do workouts or suicides. Yep. Um, I love how she, I love the add in scene of the remake where the gym teacher is with the girl that uh, Chris, who did what, you know, who committed the, the videotaped Carrie and then shared it all over social media. And how she's like, all right, well, if there's no video on your phone, I guess we don't need to worry because that kind of thing can affect college applications. And that kind of thing could really look good on the Today Show. Like, I really love that fucking delivery yeah. of those lines. And I can't remember the actress offhand now. I'm looking it up right now so you can go ahead and, like, if you want to talk, I'll look it up for us. But she was just fucking nailed it. Like, I, you really got behind the gym teacher in both. And I love in the 70s one where she slaps Chris. Like, I fucking love that Chris is, like, giving her lip, and she just rears back and slaps her, which is, yet again, something you really could not do nowadays and probably shouldn't be doing nowadays. But those girls were just malicious. And really, I only felt when Sue came around was she felt bad in the 70s one. I feel like Sue in the remake felt bad the moment the gym teacher punched her up against the locker room was like what's going on and she's like it's not funny and sue was like oh fuck it's not funny what am i what am i yeah. doing like this isn't uh, and, funny like i'm the, being a dick and the teacher the gym teacher is judy greer judy greer that's who it was but yeah um, like i i agree like uh, uh you see the turn with sue in the uh remake like and you feel like it's a genuine holy shit i feel awful for what i did mm-hmm. and like the idea like of you know having her boyfriend take carrie to the prom like she you could tell she was doing it cuz she just felt bad and she just wanted carrie to have a good time and even the boyfriend while a little confused about it like was still like i okay i get you i i'll do this like uh, you yeah. know this like a good idea where in the original 
like like you were saying with Sue, like it didn't seem like it was news. And Fred was like, if I have to, it just like he yeah. didn't see like he was kind of the reluctant to do it. He didn't buy into it at the beginning. He, he at the prom though, both times they were both really yes. nice. Tommy in both the remake. And the original, I like in the remake how he picks her up in a limo. I think that was a nice little touch. I know it's probably cheesy for some, but I thought it was really romantic. Well, and that's that's prom, right? It's sweet and prom for now, right? Like in the seventies, where you would just pick them up in their car. And I love how she uh, in the remake she she puts her mom in the closet and she locks her in there. Yeah, and Julianne Moore fucking nailed her role as this abusive religious sellout. And, you know, the, the kid on the bike, there was that throwback scene to both where the kid off the bike is teasing her, calling her Crazy Carrie, and she sends him off the bike. Like, these remi- this, the remake and the original were really similar. I feel like the yeah. remake just sprinkled in things like, oh, the video is playing at prom, you know? Yep, they, they, just, um, modern, they just added a little bit more modernization. Cause yeah. They, that, well, and I think that's kind of, like, telling of the story of Carrie in general is that the story of Carrie can be carried on from generation to generation because there's always going to be this type of high school bullying. Whether yeah. it's taken to this extreme or not, you never, like, it all depends on the situation and the location and all that. Yeah. But there's always going to be this type of little uh, awkward teenage girl getting picked on and just bullied for no reason whatsoever. And, like, yeah, it's a story that Stephen King wrote that just, it, it's just it fits for every day and age absolutely and i just really enjoyed how i I think in the first one what i did like a little bit more is how carrie experiences experiments with her uh powers a little bit more so she does a little bit more stuff around her room and being able to float textbooks and stuff and i feel like in the remake she does more research yeah um and and yet again i think that's just more timing right the you know development of the internet and and all that kind of stuff and i i think both characters really played it well i think this remake was really well done to reach a population group that may not love the 1976 one because it just may seem too dated you know, the outfits may be too dated. The The theme of how Carrie behaves kind of being awkward and shy and seeming like she's delayed and, and not really that bright, where Chloe seems intelligent and she's quite sweet and endearing when she begins to open up to people. And I enjoyed the bloodbath in the original. I think it was great for 1976, but I love the bl- bloodbath in 2013. And I love the CGI. I love the floating blood. I loved all the shit that happened. I thought it was epic. Yes. Yeah, like uh cuz yeah, like you I I really dug the original's third act with that whole prom scene, her going crazy and just wiping out everybody, but like yeah, and the, uh in the remake you could just like the special effects i think really add and ramp up a lot of what happens in that and their tension is a lot more because it i even feel like that all goes on for a little longer in the remake than it does in the original. it does it's a little bit longer yeah so you get to see a little more of the like her just getting her revenge on everybody that picked on her and i really love how sue in both cases is trying to alarm in one case, yes. she's at the back of the gym and she comes in and she's and the gym teacher kicks her out. And the other time she's already there and she sees them underneath the stage and she's trying to alarm the gym teacher and the gym teacher throws her out. And then Carrie shuts all the doors and gets her revenge. And what I liked about the remake is that she focused on specific people. Yeah. I really felt like there was more of a, a specific focus on those who had wronged her. Um, and the ending of both were, the, were different. You know, in the in the original, we have Sue being the sole survivor and, um, you know, going to Carrie's grave and dreaming that, or to the house and dreaming that Carrie reaches up and grabs her, which I thought was going to happen in the remake. So did I. I was um, waiting for it. But it doesn't. What happens yeah. instead, Ooh. we get Sue being pregnant. Uh, which I think was an interesting throw in. I don't think that was necessary. I didn't really no. get the point of that, but I guess it was supposed to be like the sin of evil baby and teenage pregnancy. Maybe that was the thing that was thrown in for 2013. Um, and then her dreaming that basically Carrie is coming out of her womb kind of thing. Right? Yeah. With the, with the hand popping up out in between yeah. her legs instead of through the ground, which was like, Oh, that's a little twisted. <laughs> you know? And I honestly, that ending didn't do anything for me. I was like, nah, no. nah, whatever. I, I think that that's a small critique compared to how strong, the rest of the movies are and honestly these are another two i put on par yep Probably i was just gonna say a little bit higher just because of the uniqueness of it at the time and i think that you know the delivery from everyone is phenomenal but i don't think the 2013 is far behind no i uh, like they are both pretty equal to me like uh like you i do think i'd put the original just a hair above but it's i could go back and forth rewatching either one of these like down the road like 
they're both really good they're both pretty much like the same story just uh with you know the added elements of more modern times if i met a young lady at 12 13 14 who wanted to get into horror movies i would probably look at the annabelle movies i would look at carrie 2013 as movies that would be great entry gateway movies like there is some blood and guts and like in both scenes she gets billy and chris and she you know fucks them up with the car scene. rightfully so awesome in the in the original where the car flips and then in the remake where it's a little more cgi and some cool shit happens like yet again i think that that was an appropriate scene to be updated you know that doesn't take anything wrong away from the value of the first one the first scene is awesome in the first right. movie, but it's great redone in in the sequel or in the in the remake and definitely i think both of these movies are on par you know well of course with the remake as we said being a little bit or the original being a little bit higher good movies recommend both highly yeah, absolutely like i i was very impressed with the remake on this one like i didn't expect it to be as good i agree i agree all right next to the big one over here all right so this is another culprit on why we didn't watch too many other movies this last time yeah <laughs> uh, so least. was that to say the least yeah to say the least <laughs> so yeah the uh next movie we are talking about is suspiria from uh music. december purple lights <laughs> lights everywhere we like lights music sorry go ahead <laughs> released on december 1978 yeah I, didn't, I couldn't find a date it just said december okay so yep. some right. random day in december everyone suspiria got released uh susie travels to germany to attend ballet school when she arrives late on a stormy night no one lets her in and she sees pat another student fleeing from the school when pat reaches her apartment she is murdered the next day susie is admitted to her new school but has a difficult time settling in she hears noises and often feels ill as more people die susie uncovers the terrifying secret and history of the place uh this was directed by the italian maestro Dario Argento. Dario Argento. Uh, And then Suspiria. The the remake (laughs) came out November 2nd, 2018. Young American dancer Susie Banyan arrives in 1970s Berlin to audition for their world-renowned Helena Marcos Dance Company. When she vaults to the role of lead dancer, the woman she replaces breaks down and accuses the company's female directors of witchcraft. Witches! (laughs) <laughs> meanwhile an all inquisitive psychotherapist and a member of the troupe uncover dark and sinister secrets as they probe the depths of the studio's hidden underground chambers mm, dun, dun, dun. uh and this was uh directed by lucas guaguino or how are, I, I probably butchered his name guaguino. but i think that sounds good but uh suspiria <laughs> yeah i don't know scott why don't you take the lead on this? I want to hear your thoughts. Okay. Oh, boy. All right. So these are two completely different movies. And <laughs> yeah, where the original is about 88 minutes long, the remake runs at about two and a half hours. It's a long um, movie. Completely, like, obviously the setting of Germany, the ballet school, that is all there. And the whole Three Mothers Witches storyline is there however the remake goes into way greater detail with the story where the italian one is more visual and Mm -hmm. artistic like it's it's almost like flashing pictures telling you the story instead of like you hearing the story on screen being spoken well and you also put together backgrounds from other things you don't have it i find the remake and i don't mean this is an insult to anyone who likes the remake um, spoon feeds you yes it it's... gives you way more than you need <laughs> like and this is why she likes to dance and this is why she went to the psychiatrist <laughs> and the psychiatrist is really curious about what's happening at the home you're going to see a lot of him from yes him. Which... It's compared in the remake where you see him for like 10 five seconds he comes in he's like yeah yeah i believe in witches and magic and shit and that shit's going down <laughs> right which which one thing if you look up the imdb for the credit of the psychiatrist or psychotherapist it is tilda swinton who is also the mother of the uh ballet school is it really so, yep so she did a dual role and like got all done up in makeup to be the old man psychotherapist oh man i didn't even see that that was pretty good um yeah. Yeah, but, are, yeah, are you talking about in the original, right? No, that's in the remake. Oh, that's in the remake. Okay. 
Um, I, I really liked the original. This is my second time watching the original and I really like it a lot. I actually really like Susie's character in this one. Uh, I find her very affable. I like how she gets to the school and like, she's trying to get a cab to get her and she gets there and, you know, she sees this chick running away and they tell her to leave and she leaves. She comes back and she's like, Hey, there was a mix up last night. They're like, Oh, we're so sorry. She's like, well, yeah, it's not really cool, but okay. Here I am in Germany. You're going to make the best of it. (laughs) And I just, I find that the other characters, like that really awkward dude who she's kind of interested in, um that is kind of like a servant basically yes uh the how the other girls treat her and i found that the dario agento was more creepy yeah um, personally yeah because it's more uh i'm trying to think of the word but it's uh, yeah i can't think of it it just has this creepy sense of dread and it is also like you are looking at a moving piece of art and like, I felt like I was watching Germany. I felt like when I watched that, I'm like, yep, that's fucking Germany. You know, over the top, colorly Europe looking windows and hallways and, you know, the pool that's upstairs and having wine at every meal. Like, I just really felt like, I'm like, Europe, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and the guy that's blind and his dog gets, his dog turns on him. Like, I that scene causes dread for me. I feel really bad for that dude. Yeah. And the subtle scareness and the use of music and the da, da, da. Yeah, I was like, da, 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 da. Like, it's da, just, da, da, it's, da, it's da, so da, well done. And honestly, it doesn't overstay its welcome. Um, it moves through the plot quickly enough. Yes, the showdown at the end is a little... It's a know, little like, hokey and It's a little silly. hokey, but... I can at least appreciate that they did what they could in 1978, right? Like, uh, and I really dig Susie. I really dig the interactions with the other people. And some people might find that acting wooden. I found it more accurate to what Europe was like. Now, that being said, the remake, you feel like you're being privileged to private conversations. Mm -hmm. You feel like you're watching an actual dance school function. And the one scene where Susie is replacing the other dancer who is accusing the company of witchcraft and the dancer gets basically mangled. That is scene. Incredible. Is, yeah, that scene is just so just, oh, man. Like, I felt everything that was going on to her. Like, and they linger on that stuff and they torment the hell out of her. Absolutely. And, and the way they use the magic by just, pretty much putting it into the moves of the ballet dancers i gotta say i really loved that you didn't have no like gloved killer like giallo style Mm -hmm. coming and cutting you and killing you and stabbing you Mm -hmm. no this is all pure witchcraft magic like just using the flow of the body to like almost like cast spells that would do it to someone else that is connected and it's Mm -hmm. It's it's almost awful to watch and like it's just you i feel so bad for that woman and like but the one thing like that the remake is just too long it does not need to be as long as it does like it could have been shortened yeah. um it really focuses on the beautiful dances and i will say that this movie has breathtaking dances so i think where you know the first spirit they're like they're at a dance school and you see them dance a little bit but it's not like how Dakota Johnson owns this dancing. Yes. Um, and, you know, I think she regrained herself from Fifty Shades of Grey series. So, you know, I think she showed here that she could act and she could pull shit off. But I agree. For me, it was a little too long, but I could understand why people who, you know, if you wanted to see this more from the dance side, and honestly, as you talked about Tilda already, she fucking nails it. Like, such a She's... talented actress. She carries yeah. this movie. Like... <laughs> incredible like, yeah incredible. she is always everything she's in she's an amazing performer she just knocks it out of the park every time every time and, and yeah like the, and i will say the cast in the remake is fucking stacked chloe grace moretz fucking tilda swinton dakota johnson jessica harper jessica harper yeah returns yeah. Or, like as a returning role uh yep. mia something i th- can't remember her name but she was in Cure mia Football goth Bus. yes mia yep. goth i know that's like one of dave z's crushes right there yeah, she's excellent. Like, it, you're right. This cast was stacked and they were good. Yeah. They were all good. So really, when it comes down to it, it's just a preference if 
you felt like it was pulled out more than it needs to be. What I feel like they did with the remake of Suspiria, they teased it. And what I mean by tease is something when you tease something to make it looser and more expanded. I think that's what they did. Yeah, um, yeah cause like with uh, the Italian cinema, sometimes the stories can be hard to follow for us that are not Italian. Like mm-hmm. it's a different way of storytelling. Mm-hmm. So I think like, you know, there's just like seeing this American remake definitely uh, is like, you know, we're going to explain everything and make it so you understand the Which story. Which is very American remake, as we know from the Japanese ones yep. that we've seen or the Asian horror ones. So it's a very, it's a trait that absolutely happens. Yep. But yeah, like, uh, but yeah, like the short, because the, uh, the way I look at Suspiria from 1978 is almost like you're watching a nightmare on screen. Like it just feels I dreamlike like that, and yeah. nightmarish. And the remake is, you know, I and that is one thing I got to give uh, credit to the remake. They did not try to copy the original. They went, instead of going for these beautiful colors and just every scene just being like a piece of art, it went for drab colors and very just realistic imagery of like what it was like 1970s Berlin like they didn't have a lot of the color lighting like they did use some which I think was a nod towards the original at the like in the last like 20 minute ending Mm -hmm. but yeah I I think that was very smart move because it makes it feel like a completely different movie with the same title because these movies while like I said before while having similar themes are completely different in so many ways and it's one of those that I feel is very hard to compare to each other. I agree with you 100%. I think that it is possible to like both equally. I will be honest. I This is a case where I prefer the original. Mm-hmm. Um, I enjoy the storytelling in the original more. I, I like Susie in the original more personally. That is not saying the remake is a bad film because it is not. It's no. highly quality, quality made. It's a very good, it pulls and teases out um, the witchcraft, the dancing, that scene of um, where she dies in the dance studio being manipulated with, with the other girls dancing is in, it's insane. Yeah. But I think that nothing can take away from the value that was in that scene. I just personally prefer the original because it's shorter and I didn't need it to be longer. Personally, not taking away from what that movie was. So. Yep. And I think I'm going to be going the route of carry on this one where i both i like both of them for completely different reasons Mm -hmm. but the original is a little higher up for me because the way the reason i say that is because if i'm in the mood to rewatch suspiria i will always go back to the original because it's easy to watch it's shorter and it's very palatable and just beautiful for the eyes like it's just one of those i just just it's just very pleasing all around and i mean and plus the score that Goblin puts on for Suspiria, the 78, is just fucking incredible and haunting. Absolutely. And I forget, the, but it's the lead singer of Radiohead is the one that did the score for the remake. And his score is also very freaking good. But it's just something about Goblin that I just love. And it's like so unsettling because the music comes on in certain scenes that you wouldn't expect it to come on. And it just like makes that scene where nothing happens feel very unsettling. Like, okay, something's about to happen. Yeah, I agree. Uh, So yeah, like I'm glad that we finally both got a chance to sit down and watch this remake because this was also a first time watch for us for the remake. Yeah, it was. And I had avoided watching it because of the length of it. Yep. Um, So I'm glad that I did, you know, push past that avoidance and watch it. Uh, would I rewatch it again? I would for a podcast. I probably went on my own accord, not because yet again, I think it's a bad movie. It just isn't my jam. It's just too long. Right. Yep. And I'll say, I'm probably very close to that with you as well. Like I may rewatch that at some point, but the original will always be one that I could always go to. Um, so yeah, we will jump on to the next movie of our topic. Uh, and that is The Fog from February 1st, 1980. Folks get ready to celebrate the centenary of Antonio Bay, but many had suffered due to crimes that founded this town. Now they rise from the sea under the cover of the fog to claim retribution. Director is, of course, John Carpenter. Uh, And then we also have the Fog remake from October 14th, 2005. When supernatural events occur in their town, Nick and Elizabeth discover that the ghosts of a crew of sailors who were killed in a shipwreck more than 100 years ago have come to exact their revenge. Directed by Rupert Wainwright. Um, 
this is also another one that is uh, very similar to the original. The remake is very similar to the original. Yeah. Has a lot of the exact same scenes. Um, this is the one where I, I, I will say I like the original better, I think. Oh, yeah. I, I think the original is a better movie. Um, I think the 2005 honestly suffered from too many 2000-isms. Yes. Um, I, so... <laughs> I'll talk about what I liked of the remake. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I liked the party scene. I thought that that was a little more accurate that a bunch of, you know, for 2005, instead of a fishing boat being out in the middle of nowhere, not that I don't think people don't go out on fishing boats, but, you know, they're out on a, on a boat, partying, drinking, having a good time, and they run into the ship and the pirates. I thought that that was a nice tie-in. I thought the scene on the boat was creepy. I thought it made sense that the one guy didn't die because his family members weren't connected back to the town. He wasn't from the town to begin with. That's why he lived. That's why he wasn't killed. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it wasn't because the fog was trying to frame him. It was because he had no connection. I thought that was clever. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I dug. <laughs> like, I didn't think it was bad. I, I did like uh, the recasting of the DJ Stevie. Yes. Yes. I and that oh, was uh, she was played by Summer Blair in the remake and Adrian Barbeau in the original. Yes. So you know, I thought both were good. I honestly did. I thought both did yeah. a good job of that specific role. I thought the sun was sweet in both ones. I enjoyed the when he's at home and the fog is trying to come into the house and he has to kind of defend himself and you know and and they go to get him in the truck. I thought that was interesting in both the remake and the original. I I I understand with the remake that they tried to do this more of a twist that Elizabeth, you know, the main protagonist, was the wife of one of the captains and she died and, you know, she's been reincarnated and they're coming back. Like, I, I, I got it. Like, I, I understood the whole purpose of it. I just... I, I don't know. I, didn't, I don't know why they threw that in there. <laughs> yeah. So- like kind of trying to figure out like i got the purpose like i got what they were trying to do i just didn't understand why yeah, it I, got put into the movie i feel it did not work and it shouldn't have been in this film like personally yeah. like and also like uh the story like the difference between why the fog is coming back like because you know they're both uh where the sailors got lost at sea one was because of betrayal like i mean they're both because of betrayal yes. but like a different style of betrayal like i forget what it was in the remake but in the original the betrayal was the townsfolk convinced it was a ship full of lepers yeah and the townsfolk had convinced them to go out to this certain area and they sunk the boat so that the lepers would die and they took their money yes and they took their gold yes. and everything like that and i forget yes. what it was in the original but it was like some sort of betrayal on the boat itself that happened yes with the family members um and i think it was betrayal for greed um but the one thing, like you were saying, with the 2000s, uh, 2000-isms is the CGI ghost fog. Like, I liked certain aspects of this, but it turned them into... <sighs> the ghosts were basically the fog, where in the yeah. original, the fog hid the actual ghosts, which were basically, like, drowned sailor zombies. Yes. And I liked that better than, like, the CGI, like, the, the fog being, like, the hand reaching out to grab the knife mm-hmm. to stab somebody, and, like, yeah, that fits more with, like, a ghost theme, but for some reason, I like the whole drowned shipmen, or the drowned sailors covered in seaweed and decayed, shambling like zombies. Like, yeah. that has more of an effect fact to me as in the horror area um and of course when you're comparing performances like from the original to this one you have the freaking powerhouses of adrian barbo tom atkins and fucking uh jamie lee curtis yeah yeah. that and you're gonna like uh because i can't remember the guy's name but the guy that played tom atkins character in the remake was from smallville which is yeah good actor but like yeah like if it's give me if when you're making it so similar i can't help but compare yeah and like tom atkins is just it was tom welling yes that was his name 
yeah and like uh but yeah like i just feel like the cat they ca the cast was better in the original like selma blair and adrian B barbo comparison i agree with you they are both like they were really decent. good like, i thought yeah. selma blair was good enough in the in the remake you know yeah i thought they were like, both pretty much on par of their right like, it just re probably really depends on who you like more as an actress and I found Father Malone, like, in the original is kind of more of a storyteller. And in, in the remake, they made him, like, crazy. And yes. that he, like, didn't know what was going on. And he was just some crazy old man. Yeah, he was, like, the drunk you know, priest. Exactly, right? And I, I found that um, kind of annoying. I And, like, the whole, like, I think the whole thing that threw me off was the Elizabeth thing. I don't understand yeah. why they felt the need to put that in there. Like, she replaced Jamie Lee Curtis's character of instead of this random hitchhiker he's driving down the street he doesn't recognize his girlfriend that just left six months earlier right and then she does that line of like are i don't know are you are you weird like from the first one where jamie lee has that conversation with tom acton right like, are you weird like it was a throwback but it was so poorly delivered that i was i groaned yeah. i was like oh <laughs> yeah like it's just like like some of the delivery of the lines in that were just like thrown in there just because they were from the original and no other reasoning like um the one thing i will criticize about the original is uh you know a lot of the same things happen when uh, like uh time atkins, time atkins picks up jamie lee curtis and all of a sudden all the windows in his truck just explode out yeah well in the in the remake they freak out a lot more because they get into like almost like an accident and yeah. they freak out about it more where in this one, they're kind of like, oh, that was weird. Let's go back and bang. <laughs> and then they go and bang. I'm like, okay. It, it just, like, I know. It, it's like you guys, like, get over things a little too quickly in that original one. Like, I'm right. just like, but, like, because I'd be and like, you know. he doesn't know her name, and he's like, what's your name uh, again? Well, and that's totally a Tom Atkinsism right there. It's like, bang it. a chick you don't know the name of, and then you, you ask know, her name whatever. afterwards. It's fucking Tom Atkinsism. And she just, like, hangs out with him. Honestly, like, that wasn't that bad. Like, that that's a small criticism yeah i'll say it's not like an, it's a nitpick and i like the spooner guy i thought he was funny in the remake where he's like and he's like i'm not even from this town i'm from chicago like <laughs> yes. i didn't find that funny like where he throws in that line like what the f and like everyone who's and, and i found that the the people that they had to have with the statue and you know the woman she didn't lose her husband she was just more like kind of power hungry and i kind of got confused who the mayor was at points i'm like is it her or is it him Who's right the fucking mayor right and I found in the remake, there was a better job of the relationship being built between the mayor and what was happening in the town. Um, I think this remake, you're right, suffered, as I said, well, we both said, suffered from the 2000-isms, suffered from trying to make that connection with Elizabeth and the original colonated people that were supposed to come, like the, the pirates or whatever they were that got screwed over. Yeah, and they, I think I, it I also they kind of put that in there. And then yeah. the kid finds a hairbrush on the on the shore, and there's that part where she can't sleep. Okay, the one scene I thought was stupid in the remake, which no, well, there's a couple, but one that I thought was real dumb was okay. So she can't sleep, right? So she gets up and she goes on Google, and then she looks up and she sees like the wet footprints in the ceiling. She's all like, "Oh yeah, this is fucking normal, <laughs> right? <laughs> oh yeah, wet footprints. This is cool." And then, like, goes out to the water, and the fog is there, and then her boyfriend comes out, and the fog goes away. The fog's like, oh, oh boys here, boys here, back up, back up, back up. Yeah, right. I want no peace. I want no peace, man. I just, I wasn't hitting on your girl. Like, it just seems it's, so, Yeah, like, it was just so cheesy. Right? I wouldn't say it's probably as horrible as some people have said. No. But... There was just parts of it like i think they would have done better if they had stuck to the original story and they just made her a hitchhiker that ran or maybe they make maybe she's new in town okay you don't want to do the hitchhiker approach because it's 2005 and people don't hitchhike fine she's there as a summer student doing yeah. some testing on water and she gets connected through nick because she needs to go out on the water and she yeah. needs to test the water that, that's perfect right there <laughs> right and and she's just some chick that's there and then while they're on the water they find this other boat and they're like what the fuck is going on like it couldn't it didn't have to be spooner and his friend spooner and his friend like spooner guy and nick could have taken her out come across a shipping boat and they'd be like oh that's fishing bud ted's boat where's ted and gone in the boat and found the body and then you know what you're like, describing what you you were describing the plot of uh tremors in a way <laughs> i guess i am it's, but, but, I mean, but, it, but it but it worked but it works so much better like, and like that makes... I, yeah right and and then it would have been she's not family like, but she still would have been the hitchhiker and then he could have had his thing with stevie because even then like he banged stevie in the remake yeah and had this weird awkward interaction in town like it was just it was 
It was a total 2005-ism film. It was like, all right, we're going to take the fog and we're going to add really cool supernatural stuff in it that wasn't in it the first time around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like, and, like, I think it, like, uh, you know, this is where, you know, I because, you know, we don't really, like, bash on CGI because it's a product of its time. Yeah. But this is where I got to say, like, the CGI versus the practical of the original loses its effect because I have to say that scene, that final battle scene in the church of the original, when the one ghost pirate steps out of the fog and you see the dark red eyes glowing. Yeah. Holy fuck, is that just creepy? Yeah. Like, it is just like, that's terrifying where I never felt that with the CG because I don't you think never it was felt scared in the remake. Yeah. You felt like you felt like the fog was just playing games. He was like, "Am I going to be here? Am I not going to be here? Am right. I going to be here? No, I'm not. Oh, got you, got you. High fives, high fives, high fives. <laughs> you know. And then, like in the remake, when Tom Atkins goes to the door and the fog is knocking, it's ominous and creepy. Yeah. And 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 it fades naturally, not because it like comes up to the shore and then leaves because she goes down to the water. And then her boyfriend right. comes down, and, and it was seriously like, "Oh man, the boyfriend's here. Got a piece." And I just found that piece. <laughs> Oh, well, you know, anyway. And there's another thing I didn't, I never even put the connection together, but I like this because John Carpenter just loves to do like the subtle things in the background, but like that scene with Tom Atkins where like the fog is like knocking. You just see yeah. a silhouette of a shape of a man like just standing there. Yes. And yeah, like that is also just like something like just you just quickly glance and you're going, well, that's creepy. Like it's just something just so small like that, but it just like it's so effective. And really, if I guess I'm honest for the remake, the only things I really enjoyed about the remake was I liked how they did the throwback to the car, like the truck scene with getting the little boy yeah, and fleeing the house. I liked that. I liked how the party scene, the party boat scene, that was honestly the only thing that they added in that I was like, all right, I buy this for 2005. Yeah, and it's more modern. Dying, right? Because he wasn't from there. Right. Like I bought into that. Dude's from Chicago, has nothing to do with this history. The fog's not after him. I get that. Right? Like I, I thought that was good, but that's about where the uh where it ends for me yeah like um personally yeah like this would be this like i don't know if i would ever go back and rewatch the remake the original no. yeah i would re i would rewatch oh, yeah. it I, I think the remake and also the ending with her and we even got to the cheese cheese ending yet where she sees the ghost and he comes up and kisses her and then she turns into a ghost mm. and she goes off with him and she goes into her like old school like dress and shit. Yeah, like, and the hairstyle gets different. This, oh man, it made it into this romantic story, and her boyfriend's all like, "Oh man, Fog just took my girl." Like that, I kind of was my girl, but I was banging the DJ on the side. Like it was just, it was so. When that and... scene happened, I just went, <sighs> <sighs> "Really, movie? We went there." Yeah, like, and and it's a shame. I I think this was a remake that could have been better than it was if it had just made some different choices. Yeah. Um, you know, not done the whole Elizabeth supernatural was the wife of this and connected to the ship. And here's my hairbrush that, you know, and then it goes back and it connects, Oh, there's her hairbrush. And here's a picture of them together in case we weren't smart enough to figure it out throughout the entire movie. Right. And I just found that really mind numbing personally. Yeah, same here. It just it just was very generic. Very generic is the best word to use. So as you can tell, Scott and I love the remake and can't wait yeah. to rewatch it over and over again. Like I still gave uh, it like a five point five because it's like it's in that average range, but it's nothing special. Oh, that's higher. I gave it a four. Yeah. I, See, if I, I didn't if I, mind it. Like if it's anything below a five means I dislike it. And I don't dislike it. It's just there. Yeah, you're right. Maybe I'll give it a five then. Because I, I don't dislike it either. I wouldn't get angry about it. Like, I just think, I just think, I just don't get why they went the, the route they did. <laughs> right. Like, I, I really wish you could talk to, like, the writer and the director and the, and be like, so what exactly? Well, more the Where writer you the thinking? director just gets what, <laughs> directs what they're given. Like, why, why did you make this change? <laughs> why did you think this was a good idea? Um, and the delivery of certain lines in this were, were quite painful. You thought they were playful, but they were painful. So, yes, the yes. Fog original... <laughs> Nothing can touch it. Jamie Lee Curtis, Tom Atkins, um, Andrew Barbara, like awesome film, great special effects. You love how you think Father McMahon's gonna Mahone's gonna live. He doesn't. Uh, yeah, great. that that epic showdown scene with the mold and the cross and the cross being lit bright. Oh, like, man. man, that's so well, good. Well, and, and he knows the sins of what he's done, and he's trying to tell, like, he's like, I don't think we should do this celebration. And like, well, we got all the party plates. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> but the fireworks, I, I think we got to go forward. Yep. I just, there's, and, there's no shark in the ocean. We can open the beach again. Right. It's all good. <laughs> I don't know what you're upset about. They're going to just have to get over it that our ancestors were dicks. And, you know, the book that he finds at the beginning in the supernatural events, I just found like the first one was a much better supernatural ghost story. Yes, ex- much it really was. Story, ghost story. So I guess we'll move on to our final. Oh, not oh. our final. Sorry, our last two. Yeah, our penultimate, if you will. Yes. Uh, so the next movie on our list is Prom Night. Prom, Prom Night. Night. <laughs> uh, released on September 12th of 1980. This slasher movie follows a relentless killer who is out to avenge the death of a young girl who died at now high school students. The guilt-ridden kids have kept their involvement a secret, but when they start being murdered one by one, it is clear that someone knows the truth. Also, coping with the past are members of the dead girl's family, most notably her prom queen sister, Kim Hammond. Which basically this whole synopsis gives away the entire movie. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> The only thing it didn't reveal is uh, the, who the killer is. No, but it, it got pretty close. <laughs> it sure fucking did. Uh, but it is directed by uh, Paul Lynch. Uh, and then the Prom Night, Prom Night release uh, remake was released April 10th of the night. Donna's senior prom is supposed to be the best night of her life, but a sadistic killer from her past has different plans for her and her friends. Yes. Directed by Nelson McCormick. <laughs> <laughs> so these two movies have some small things in common. Like the prom. <laughs> like the prom. There is um, an argument about who's going to become prom queen. That is very clear when the ladies, you know, young, young ladies show up. There's one popular girl in both that is like, I'm going to be prom queen, not you. Right. That is a common theme. Uh, there is a bathroom. I'm just going to go to the bathroom and freshen up kill in both. Uh, where one of the characters goes to the washroom to freshen up and gets killed. Yep, and there's also the famous line that's used throughout all the franchise of Prom Night, which was, uh, it's not who you come to the prom with, it's who you go home with, or something along those lines. Yeah. So definitely, you know, there was some shout outs, but uh, I would argue that there was a lot more that was different. Now, um, Scotty used to not like Prom Night. Night. Yeah, I was not a fan of it originally, like the first time I'd seen it. This is technically my third time now, Mm -hmm. Um, but the first time I watched it, I found it just rather boring. Mm -hmm. Like, I just didn't care. And then I rewatched it last year and gave it much more of my attention, and I enjoyed it quite a bit more. Mm -hmm. Like, I still kind of just like, it was good, but it wasn't great. Mm -hmm. And this third watch, I really like it. Like, it's it's higher up there now it just took a little bit because it's very character focused and yes and that is what it like i learned only like is the characters in this because it takes a long time before your typical slasher stuff really even truly happens like till till yeah. prom technically starts yeah absolutely um, i do i now this is a canadian made film the original prom name uh, Leslie Nielsen is in it, who is yes. our Canadian treasure. Love Leslie Nielsen. And, and I do appreciate that it starts off in this old building with these kids. And I feel like that was very much an 80s movie that you would have like this like horrible event that occurred and then someone would need to get revenge afterwards. So yep. you think that, I think the first time you see this movie, if you're not aware of the outcome, you do believe it's that, you know, predator that's broken out of prison or mental hospital and has come back yes. to finish the job of the Which- other kids. That is kind of an element they take a thread of and put into the remake. They do. They definitely do. Um, I, I I love Jamie Lee Curtis in this. I love her yes. interaction with herself and Paul, who she's planning to go to the call prong with. I believe his name is Paul. Um, I love I love it. I think that they're super cute uh, leading up to the prom night. Uh, I I also enjoy all the friends. And you kind of feel bad for some of the other characters like there's some like i want to make sure that i'm saying the name right that it's paul nick sorry nick nick and jamie lee curtis are the ones that are going to the prom together and i really like the lead up to it and you can tell that he's feeling guilty about what happened to his sister um where wendy and kelly and vicky don't necessarily seem to have the same level of guilt no does 
And I do enjoy the interactions between uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. And I think it's her brother that is named Paul. Is that what I know? Oh, Alex. Alex is her brother. So I think what I was really shocked about when I looked at this was um, the relationship between Alex and Jamie Lee Curtis's character. I had no idea that Alex was the killer. Even when I rewatched it, I tried to watch it with fresh eyes. I didn't think he was the killer. Did you get that vibe? No, not at all. Like throughout the whole, like they never give you really any clues to go on that make him like even make him a red herring even. Which yeah. is, I think, what kind of made me just a little, like, not a fan of that originally. Because, you know, I'm used to the typical slasher formula of, oh, there's going to be some red herrings. Mm-hmm. And eventually it can be like, oh, yeah, okay, I can see why this person did this. But, like, I didn't, like, see the lead up to that and it threw me off. But, like, I, yeah, I dig that there was that relationship between them. And, like, mm-hmm. yeah, like you were saying, and, like, just the relationship between all the main characters in this movie it's like you could tell they were friends that went through something, but they were trying to move on. Like, especially her girlfriends were all definitely like, just all right, let's get the hell out. Of, let's forget all about the past. Yeah. And, and and what I really found interesting about this movie is at the end where you find out that it is Alex, it all made sense. Yeah. Like, I didn't need the red herring to, to lead it up to make me think that. Right. Like, I don't get why, like, uh, like I, you don't need it all the time and like just if you're doing a good storytelling then you shouldn't have to do a red herring and all that like you can just leave it a mystery and I love that yeah I really I really did enjoy that piece of it and I I really think that this film uh, the original prom night anyway does such a great job of the kills and the relationships the running through the school all that other thing all the other stuff that happens in it it's a great 80s slasher so we have the prom night from 1980, which is very much a slasher, as we were just saying, that represents the 80s. How would you say you see prom night 2008? I feel that this remake of prom night is very lifetime thriller. Uh, obviously, war rated R because of the violence that they ramp up in this one. But it just has that like glossy, clean feeling to it that you see in all these Lifetime movies with a typical just bland story where it's like, you know who the killer is right from the beginning. Like they don't make any qualms about hiding who it is. They show his face. They show everything. The motive behind it, it's all there. Um, besides the main character who I thought did an amazing doubt and him murdering her parents and him coming after her, like after he escapes, uh, I feel like the other characters are just throwaway. Like there's just yeah. nothing to them. They're bland. I would agree with you, Scotty. I think that the other characters, you didn't have enough time to build relationships with them. Basically, we get a relationship with Donna, and we understand that Donna has been stalked by her teacher, and then her teacher has been locked away because she he murdered her entire family. And, you know, she goes to this prom night with these, with these other kids, and you get the impression that she has a super nice boyfriend, and they get this pretty ball in hotel room for a bunch of fucking 17 year olds um i was pretty jealous because i wasn't getting hotels rooms at all when i was 17 nor would my parents let me stay in one right Um, especially with your boyfriend being right there from prom (laughs) probably would have happened but that's fine um i can forgive it that this is a fantasy right and then they had those real slow-mo dance scenes like i felt like they were trying to do a shout out to the dance scene in the original prom night yeah but only the original dance scene is a lot better than this like throw out to like 2000 isms i do like the kids enough at prom though if i think if this was just a you know if they called this grad night dance or something else and didn't try to connect it back to prom night as a reimagining it would have been a fine enough slasher it wouldn't have been great it wouldn't have been something that i would say to people run out and see but i would say this yet again would be a nice little introductory horror film for teenage girls yeah because i i didn't hate this like it's it's just a little, just when you're comparing it to the original, like we're doing for this show, it just, yeah, it's, it's not as, uh, not doesn't have as much of a punch. No, and like the kill scenes, like the one kill scene that's probably the best is where the chick is, her best friend Lisa is underneath the, you know, ends up in the basement uh, because she realizes who the teacher is there at prom. So we should say the teacher shows up at prom. He gets out in the mental hospital and, you know, the police are, are informed three days later that he's on the loose and, like there's just so many stupid things that happen in the film but yeah you know 
Lisa's running underneath and she gets killed by him and slowly but surely he kills off all the girlfriends not killing off the boyfriends strangely enough just the girls get killed um which I didn't quite get and and Donna gets stalked again but my favorite throwaway line so basically prom shuts down because this guy has stalked all these kids at prom and Donna's boyfriend calls his parents so she's living with her aunt and uncle she's been relocated to live with her aunt and uncle since her parents died and he's like hey I called my parents and told them what was going on and they said it's okay if I spend the night and they're like of course all right Scott would you let your fucking 17 year old kid be like hey uh people at prom just got murdered uh Don the ex crazy teacher is after Donna I'm just gonna go back to her house and chill would you let your son do that no nope, I'd be like I am coming to get your ass right now and you were coming home right like I don't this isn't like oh you know one of our friends had a seizure and died at prom okay also also let's just rem- you brought up something that I brought up in our chat that I almost forgot about why 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 did when all of this shit happens with the teacher killing everybody and they get her out of the freaking hotel what do they do the cops take her back to her freaking house where he knows where she lives i know i don't get why they didn't take her to a safe house or they didn't or the take police her, station <laughs> or the police station or any, anywhere else you know like yes this, let's put you right back in the spot where he can come and find you it's like protect her take her to the police <laughs> station what are you doing <laughs> and i think this just shows your point to being in a lifetime movie because like that is something that happens in lifetime movies it is not any kind of logical like but you know the whole thing of them not being informed that this dude got out you know he massacred an entire family including a little boy and no one's gonna alert her or the family that he got right. out and is like fucking chilling and chasing her like come on now um you know but if i if i turn off my brain and i watch this film and i watch it from the outlook of like a basic simple slasher that if i was you know bored on saturday afternoon and just wanted to watch something that moved along that was bubblegum for my brain i probably would watch it if i wanted to show it to a 13 14 12 year old young lady who maybe wanted to get into horror and was it ready for other stuff? I maybe would show it. Do I think it's like what I recommend it to people to watch? Probably not. No, like this. Yeah, that's just one of those where it's like if I was flipping through cable and it was on, I'd be like, eh, fuck it, and just throw it on. Yeah. Like, I would. Yeah, that's just. It's like a guilty pleasure. It kind you know of what is. I mean? It's like that chocolate chip ice cream that you know is bad for you, or not. No, because chocolate chip ice cream is good. I don't know. Think of like something that's like a Twinkie. I don't know, something that you know is really not that great for you, but you kind of just want it, and you kind of just want to, like... Just, you just have that craving for something just simple, and... Yeah, <laughs> and that, that's what probably it is. It pretty much is. Like, if you can't tell, like, we both enjoy the original way more. <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the original is is very good, and, and you know, I think the... I think if they had remade it, and even if they went with this plot line, I think they just could have done things a little bit stronger, but it's not an unentertaining movie. It's just you can't compare the two. So yes, obviously the yeah. original is a much stronger film and stays with you in the ending scene when Alex is dying. It's heartbreaking and sad and you feel bad. Uh, you don't really get that at the end of prom night because the boyfriend does get killed and she has to fight off. And there's like a really like lackluster scene between her and the police officer kind of just ends there. It's like they were like, all right, we're done with filming this shitty movie. We should just stop it now. Um, right. Is basically what happened. So hopefully it gave some of those young actors and actresses a start more than anything else. Um, and that's the only thing I can really wish for them. You know, that they started this movie, they had a good time dressed up in prom clothes and pretty dresses and shit like that for a couple hours. Or what about like, okay, last point on the prom make, uh, remake, those young girls are in the elevator. They're 17 years old. And oh my those God. Fucking creepy, like 25, 26, 27 year old dudes are fucking hitting on them. Yeah. Talk how, about coming how, up. Or they were almost 30. They looked old. Yeah. They were businessmen that looked like they were at a business meeting at a hotel and they fucking just like, hey, we're going to be having a party up in our room. You should come up there after the prom. And they're like, oh my God, you fucking sleazeball, disgusting pricks. And I will and I will say the, the girls in this movie did a good job of looking like they were in high school. High yeah. school seniors, but they looked like they were in high school. They looked young. And that was like fucking unnecessary to me. I'm like, what are these yeah. creepy pieces of shit doing hitting on young girls? Like, it's not like they look like college chicks that like, okay, I could buy it. Maybe they're in college. They're 20, 21 years old. 
these looked like fucking 17 year olds and, it, and that's disgusting what i was hoping to come from all of that like yeah i it's fucking disgusting but oh, you're you gonna kill them yeah i was hoping oh that, man me too yeah we'll see what i was hoping is that you know after you know the killer is revealed and she sees that the teacher guy is back she ends up running to that floor to escape him and finds the party and you know the guys are all drunk and hitting on her and the teacher sees it gets psychotically jealous and starts killing everyone in that room oh that would have been great yeah that would have added to it a lot more because then you'd be like yes those sleaze balls fucking got it and it would just add it to the body count but like they because i thought they i so thought they were going to be brought back in at some point as a way to just add up more body count yeah, I agree. And yeah, yeah, that would have been, that, that been a much better ad. <laughs> yeah, but that's OK. You know, so bottom line is I, I would not recommend watching the Prom Night remake unless you really like 2000 movies. Like yeah, a lot. And, or you're like us suckers that just like, you know what? We've seen the original. Let's watch the remake. Exactly. <laughs> so the next uh, the final set of movies for our topic tonight is Maniac, which was released on December 26th, 1980. A traumatic childhood leads to a deranged mama's boy on a gruesome killing spree on the streets of New York City. New York City! Uh, directed by William Lustig. Uh, then Maniac from 2012 uh, is a remake of the 1980 film of the same name and follows the violent exploits of a brutal serial killer. Directed by Frank Calfone and I have to just add this in, but was written by horror director from uh, French horror director Alexandre Aja. Mm. Um, and the the big the first one star the original stars Joe Spinell as Frank, and then the remake stars Elijah Wood as Frank. And once again, this is one of those remakes where it's totally been modernized and. Uh, in a way, gentrified, since it's a much different style of New York City. Yeah. But, uh, like, the storylines are very, very similar, but the way it all plays out is very different, and the way it is filmed is very different. Yeah. Like, the way the remake is filmed is a first-person perspective of Frank's character as, Eli like, Elijah Wood's character, where you just see a lot of just his hands and not him unless he's yep. looking in a mirror yeah or in certain aspects where when he becomes the killer he has that out of body experience where the camera pulls out and turns around on him and you see him doing the x which is how i took that is when it pulls away from the first person it's like you're leaving the body as the killer is taking over um but man these are just two of these remakes that i just find or two of these movies that i just find to be freaking excellent like I'm not even sure how to begin because like in the 80s one, it's very grimy and sleazy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Joe Spinell is just gross and sweaty. See, and... I didn't find him gross. Like, I mean, it's just like like the sweatiness makes him look gross when he's freaking out because there are certain points where he's killing and it's like that up close picture of him like zoomed in and he's just yeah. like sweaty. I guess so. I honestly, though, strangely enough, I actually found him quite endearing. Um, his relationship with the main woman, I can't, I wanted to look up her name. I was uh, too busy uh, reading about him. Caroline Monroe. Caroline Monroe. I, I don't know really, her main character name, but. I really dug Anna. I really dug their relationship or their budding relationship that was on its way. I really liked him. Obviously, he was engaging in some pretty fucked up shit, but I felt sorry for him. Because he clearly felt remorse afterwards. Yes. Um, that is the one thing that I love about this original. It is a very deep character study of someone that was been traumatized and the left lasting effects on someone that is not stable enough to cope with them. And like, you know, obviously he's just vile and evil for what he does to some of these people, but when you when he meets carolyn monroe's character and like you could tell he's actually attracted to her and they go on that first date to that really nice dinner like you can tell he is trying his best to be as normal as possible and not let like his urges take over and you can see like the anxiety in him as he's starting to get uncomfortable and you're like you're just rooting for him to be like just move on you can do this and i will be honest what i liked in this one compared to the remake is that that dinner scene caroline was much more likable anna in the remake or anna sorry anna in the original or in the remake isn't as likable i did not find her as likable as i did of anna in the original 
um i, I felt like that she had more pure intentions in the original yes because i would say uh carolyn monroe's character like and frank they have this like romantic connection that you're like yes i can see like you you want like you could see this happening where in the remake there's obviously that romantic connection they're trying to give but i see anna in the remake more as like she could be his best friend but like it's just like i i never i didn't feel the romance there yeah but he wanted there to be a romance yes exactly and that's where that's where that's where that one stumbles a little bit for me. And I agree with 100% with what Daisy said when he reviewed this movie. Like how she fucking throws in that she has a boyfriend in the remake. Yes. Was pretty shitty. Like yeah. she let him on. I really think she did. Oh, she absolutely did. And that's kind of turned off a little bit of the remake for me. Well, I'll say, and she was manipulative because she used him basically for his mannequins. Right. And I, I don't think she was purposely trying to use him. No. But I think she conveniently left out that she had a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. Um, Which, you know, I don't think women have to disclose everything they're, who they're with or whatever. And if it wasn't a super serious relationship and she was willing to engage in a romantic relationship, like, you know, whatever the case may be, um, I don't see the point of bringing it up at all. But if, I felt like she was like, oh, you want to go have a drink with my boyfriend? Oh, sure. Yeah, that sounds like not the most fucking awkward thing in the entire planet. Especially um, when we just had this intimate connection here. Yeah, no, not weird at all that we've been like, you know, hanging out and doing all this stuff. And, you know, you haven't, you asked me about my girlfriend, but never mentioned. So, which made me think she probably had feelings for him. Mm -hmm. But what I liked about Frank in the original is I just felt like there was more guilt and that the urges would come and it was like it was someone else doing it and then he would regret it after it was done yes uh like because elijah wood also his character does that as frank as well but mm, with I joe spinell feel... with joe spinell though i feel he did it better he did i don't think elijah wood felt that bad and i say that because in the ending scene when he does kill actually Anna, yeah no like, you're blaming you're the correct. mannequins yes because you're correct because he's actually in uh because he's he's turned it into a uh because yeah you're correct because he elijah woods frank is very uh nar narcissistic and he's like turning the blame on his victims but in his head he's thinking of thinking that it's his mother so he's turning yes. the blame on her look what you made me do look at yeah. this like he's angry at his mother where frank joe spinell's character in the original is more like why are you doing this mom why did i have to do this to you you didn't like and he you can see yeah. he breaks down in tears and he's like just so distraught over what he's doing he he yeah, and that's the thing right he's much more dear I, don't get me wrong i like elijah wood's performance i think the scene with that chick and he goes you know meets her for dinner they go back she takes off her clothes she has a mirror on top of her ceiling which sounds like a life goal for me um <laughs> i dig that idea right but um yeah <laughs> anyway that's what we're talking about but i i i liked that i liked the filming of it i liked elijah wood's performance it it takes nothing from that film I, I, I like that he runs a mannequin shop. I thought it was really cool, but I prefer the original because I bought more into Frank. I bought more into his relationship with Anna. I hate that scene in the cemetery where he changes because I feel bad for her. I feel bad for him. I feel bad when he goes home and he's, you know, basically overcome by the mannequins where he, you could tell he feels guilty. I just felt, and I also felt like he was less weird in the original like, yeah. i felt like he could carry conversation more and he wasn't so awkward and he was like you know a little more charming and i, I don't know i liked him a lot more like i just yeah. i honestly dug that character i'm like you know yeah and this one uh mind if he took me out for dinner he's not that, <laughs> he's not that like elijah would i'd be like you're a fucking weirdo i'm not going anywhere near you you weird ass person but like right I, yeah like it's like he, he portrays a different style of frank which yes. is like why it's hard for me because like uh but i will say the one thing i like you had brought up that cemetery scene like it just felt like he snapped out of nowhere so mm -hmm. fast and i wish that didn't happen yeah. where in the ending <sighs> like when he because like when he accidentally reveals to her like about her friend well, how, how he knew she that knew. the friend died yeah in the bathtub yeah. which she was a bitch so I got why he killed her. Like I feel like in the first movie too, he didn't he didn't kill people that were bitches. Like in the remake, some of the people like I'm like, well, yeah, she was kind of nasty. I get why he killed her. Yeah, like that, that. That's what I was gonna say. Like I like that ending for the remake because like in the ending of the remake, he's 
you know, he's just like trying to comfort her and like pretending like, oh, I didn't kill that person, but he's trying to comfort her. And then he accidentally lets it slip. And then like, that's when it, like she was smart enough to pick up on it. Like, wait a minute. Yeah. And I like that because it built up that tension. And then, you know, like his obsession with her, like, try, like I, yeah. I liked it there. Cause it was like, it was a more gradual, like realization where in the original, it just almost was like, oh, Hey, I did this. And mm-hmm. then I was like, oh shit. Like, mm-hmm. so it's that, that, that part I'd have to give credit for it. And like, yeah, th- this is one of those tough ones for me. Cause I love both of these movies dearly. Like they are, for different reasons completely like they are just like i love that 80s griminess of like what it looked like in new york at that time yeah. and like it's very like it looks real like you're watching a serial killer documentary i agree with you 100 percent, and i think i i agree with you that both films are filmed so differently and have values to each i think what they did with the remake though is they made it their own they took yes. a true readaptation they kept with the basic bones of the story so you would still be like all right like i can still understand the story i get the story i think elijah would make the character made the character his own yep um i do enjoy how the girls that he killed like even the chick leading the club was kind of bitchy and then you know the girl that he kind of takes goes back to her house she seems kind of you're not unsure you're unsure of her intentions with him yeah like Um, she was she almost came off as a little too friendly like i i was it almost came off as she was an escort yeah like she was good like i was waiting for her to be like all right that's a hundred dollars now yeah like and i feel like in the original like he he just chooses a nurse that's leaving work like he has no yeah he has no like reasons for who he picks a lot of the time it's just someone he sees and they're more remorseful because they're not bad people yeah and i feel like not that like the chick that he went home with was a bad person no she just wasn't like as endearing she was hot great but she wasn't as endearing and i think that that was the difference of these two films um but both extremely well done uh in both situations he they give the impression that he dies so he opens his eyes at the end of the first maniac yeah um, and I, I, yeah i i think they both honestly this is another one where they're both on par for me i think that i personally just like the original a little bit more because i just like the casting a little bit more but that doesn't take away from how good the remake is yeah because like i think the slick stylishly cool looking version of the remake uh it just fits with the new age of new york city and like it's very gentrified Mm -hmm. uh style and like the filmmaking kind of matches that and the fact that it's all about the uh art house style exhibits which is totally new york and uh like like oh yeah we're gonna make mannequins like this whole do an art museum thing of this mannequins it's like yeah only the weird arty artsy type would be thinking of that in new york um where yeah and like and then yeah you got the grimy look of the 80s like it's just they're so different but yet like the stories are so similar like the original maniac was in my before i'd seen the remake like year this was like when i just made a list randomly but uh the original remake was in my top five of all time horror films and now i would probably put them both at my top five because i can't i could not pick one that i like over the other i like them both so much for just different reasons like they are both like right there. Yeah, I agree with you. I I think that they're both strong films, and I recommend checking either one out. Um, so yeah, so that that covers. We covered off some major remakes. Obviously, we didn't cover off all remakes, uh, and just kind of talked about the difference between readaptations and remakes, and and staying with the original stories and moving away. You know, we have examples of like where the Maniac or Texas Chainsaw Massacre kind of took their own flair to it. I guess you would say, keeping things similar but also adding in differences, uh, particularly from filming, st- filming styles. Or you have stuff like Prom Night or Nightmare on Elm Street, where it completely redid a story. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, which are interesting that those are probably definitely two of the least liked or the fog where they added in something that probably didn't need to be there in the first place. Yeah, it's interesting. It's it's been an interesting journey with looking at these remakes and why they're done. I definitely think when you're looking at a remake, and so if we move into out of our dark segment, and if I were to look at, you know, and I'll let Scott think about this as I talk. If I were to look at things like if you're looking at doing a remake, what should you think about? I think you should think about the length of time. When when was the original made? 
you know, how long ago was it made and what can you do differently? So if we look at the thing, for example, you know, there was enough time there that there was more that they could do with special effects. So they could do the whole thing, jumping from body to body to body without, um, they could have done that in 1951 as well. You know, they were able to do that in 1982 and make it look good. So I think time is important. Is is our or in Carrie where they were able to kind of throw in more of the social media piece of it, a little bit more of the modern like you recording it on your phone and and a modernization of Carrie perhaps having more knowledge, you know, more knowledge about breasts, also known as dirty pillows, which I thought was really funny. Um, I like me some dirty pillows, and we all like to me some dirty pillows, don't we? You know, I thought that was really well done. And I, I think that's important. Like, are you going to modernize it in a way that makes sense? Or are you going to throw something into it like the fog where you feel like you're retelling a story and adding a romantic piece in there that, you know, you think that maybe audiences didn't care about the first one because there was no romantic piece in it. Well, maybe it wasn't needed. You know, maybe you didn't need the romantic piece. Maybe the romantic piece or the relationship was just the the planet or or the town versus the fog. And I think that's an important thing when looking at remakes. You know, I really think there could be a killer Cujo remake. If I had the money and I had the power and the, and the focus and the, and the knowledge to write, I would love to write a remake to Cujo. I have yeah. a great screenplay in my head, in my little other head <laughs> on how I, and even an opening scene that I would not back down from that. I would insist that I wanted in that film. Um, where I think I could make it more modernized that people of today would buy into the story a little bit more. There's a different way that I would film it to make it a little more interesting for people like me who didn't find it interesting. That's where I see the importance of remakes. If you're going to do a remake, you know, you need to make the decision of what the purpose is. I, what do you think, Scott? Is there anything that I said that resonates with you or something else that you would want to think of? Yeah, well, right off the bat, I do agree. Like uh, when you're doing a remake, it's good to modernize it in a way that makes sense and will be relatable to the audience to its, of the time, especially if it's a film that's, you know, anywhere between 20 to 30 years old. Like, it's going to be a completely different time, so things are going to be different, and you got to find a way to implement those into the story. Um, one thing I want to bring up is, especially like if you're looking at doing remakes um, and you want to keep to the main story, like, like the uh, original Carrie and the Carrie remake. If you're going to do something like that, make sure it is a story that it can last till uh, can span the end of time. Cause like I was saying, the story of bullying is always going to be relevant. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you can find like a story that has a theme like that, that will be relevant in this day, then don't really change much except for modernize it. Yes. But if it's something that's just, does not work for this time you're going to need more than just modernizing it you're going to need to change the story up you're mm -hmm. going to need to do something different but while keeping certain pieces of it together uh this is where the prom night one failed they did try doing something different but they did not like keep enough to tie it in and make it fleshed out and make sense um kind of like the nightmare on elm street too right as much as we didn't hate that one yeah. You know, it, it does kind of fall in the realm of it tried to be too out there. And, and the script didn't make a lot of sense. And similar to the prom night one, like there were just so many holes that you were like, okay, guys, come on. Like, right. come on now. Like your audience isn't that dumb. Like, can you, <laughs> like, can you kind of make this look like at least makes sense and the decisions make sense? Right, exactly. Because, yeah, like, and, you know, once again, the Maniac remake in the original, it's like they kept that uh, that story, but they fleshed it out and modernized it in a different way. Same with the yeah. Suspiria remake. They yeah. they took the idea and fleshed the hell out of it. Yes, they fleshed out and they explained it. And, you know, and yet again, we're not saying that's a bad film. For me, it's just too long. It's same yeah, and I, I was saying that's kind of what you got to right. do, like, for things, like, especially, like, Italian films for especially from the 70s and 80s for an American audience now yeah it's not going to be as relatable unless you're a film connoisseur or just like a fan of horror so like you would need to do something a bit different to make it more like Americanized I agree I agree um but, yeah like it's uh, like you know there's all and there's always like the you know remake remakes we didn't get to but the one that I felt was a very very pointless remake was Funny Games because it is not only done by the exact same director, it is exactly scene for scene, word for word. So why did it get remade? 
because the original was German and subtitled, and he remade it with American actors in English. And it was the exact same movie. Exact same movie. Mm. Like, the only difference is you had Naomi Watts as the mother instead of, like, this German actress I didn't know. That's interesting. Yeah. Like, I mean, both of them were good movies, but at the same time, I'm just going, but why? Why? What What was the point of this? Like, I like those are the types of things you got to be careful about. Like, you know, I ain't no fucking expert, but at the same time, like... I know what I like when it comes to remakes and I love it when the remake tries to do something new, like at least add a little bit of something to it. Yeah. I think that's a good guide for making remakes, you know, cause it, remakes, as we said, can bring new people into the genre. It can help keep copyright. Um, it can be a great cash, you know, a guaranteed cash revenue. So you can make other movies or it can bring new love back to the genre or maybe introduce you to a film that you, you know, you see the, the, the remake and maybe you go back in time and you watch the original, but yeah, it has to be done properly. If not, then it's a big waste of time. Yeah, exactly. I completely agree a hundred percent. Like, that, that's what's been fun about like exploring all these and comparing them to the originals and like you know i'll even bring it up with pet cemetery pet cemetery remake tried to do something different um whether it worked or not really depends on the person for me it didn't yeah but but like i know some people lance love it <laughs> you know and i don't mind it honestly yeah. i didn't, I didn't hate the pet cemetery remake i but i don't hate a lot of remakes i you know we talked about the ones that i wasn't a huge fan of um and yet again i just don't watch it again if i really didn't like it i just don't rewatch it again right exactly that's how i look at it <laughs> right so it's been a very interesting discussion so we'll see where remakes go um there's been that rumor floating around about the exorcist being remade for 2021 i don't know if that's accurate or not i've seen so many different conflicting resources on that right um so i guess we'll see if it's remade it's remade i guess we'll see what happens yep um and one day maybe i'll get to remake that cujo movie that i've been dreaming about we'll see hell yeah hell yeah when all I, we gotta say is who's a good boy who's a good boy? boy i just want to work with dogs that's why i know you do <laughs> right that's really what this is all about so thank you for listening next time we will have a very special guest on yes with us. we will um someone who is inspirational in the podcasting community and his name is dave z and he will be or joe pesci <laughs> or joe pesci uh, <laughs> many of you will know james c from his very impressive podcasting resume uh including exploding heads uh the abcs of hidden horror banana laser and the skeleton crew so Dave C has definitely a wealth of experience, listens to everyone's podcast, um, as well as I should uh, mention the Watsi party. He is currently, those are his two current pieces of work that he's doing, which is Exploding Heads and the Watsi party. So we are looking very forward to having Dave C on. That's that episode is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, yes. And we'll get definitely Dave C to talk a little bit about his experience with podcasting and, you know, definitely get his thoughts. He's definitely not shy. So he'll be definitely open with sharing what he has to say. Yep, and it'll be such a blast to have him on, and it'll be so much fun talking the topic, but we'll keep the topic secret for now, yes. but it, it'll be fun, and I think people will get a little chuckle when we talk about it, just because it's been heard before on our show. Absolutely, and uh, it's it's basically, we're just making fun of Brandon Orlick. No, just kidding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, that'll probably happen. It'll probably happen, but so... Anything to, to say before we uh, before we peace out there, Scotty? Uh, yes, I want to just give out some plugs to uh, go check out the Legion Podcast Network. Uh, as Heather said earlier, before our break earlier, uh, please check out check out all the shows and whatever ones you like. Please, you know, uh, like, share, subscribe, rate and review. You know, everything that helps them out. Uh, also, you know, we did those two commentaries for the Legion Pod, uh, Legion Podcast's Patreon page. So if you are not a patron yet, why not? It's only a couple dollars and you get awesome content and we are going to continue releasing more fun content for that as the months go on. Um, also, please check out our very first episode of Controllers Up, Cards Down, the All-Star Gaming Podcast. Uh, we will be happy to, I, I will love to hear feedback from this and we hope you guys enjoy this as something different, especially if you are a gamer of any type, please give it a listen. We are all just a bunch of nerds and we just love to talk nerdy things. And we also have a Facebook group for the Friday Nightmares podcast. So please go and uh, ask to join our podcast group on Facebook. Uh, we also have a Controllers Up Cards Down All-Star Gaming Podcast Facebook group. So once again, just please go ask to join and we'll let you in. Uh, but yeah, um, that is all the plugs. So 
Until next time, unpleasant dreams. Bye. Or the remake, until next time, <laughs> unpleasant dreams. What a nerd. <laughs> oh my God. See you guys later. Bye. This will keep it quiet. Oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You caught me cutting a new show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. I said quiet! My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. Wouldst thou like to live deliciously? Not that, but also, yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs, costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash legionpodcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars, you can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash legion podcasts. We appreciate it, and thank you for listening. Now, back to the cutting room. <laughs>